Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. I think we'll get some more folks joining. But uh, today we got folks on Zoom and here at the bar office in San Francisco as well as LA. We will endeavor to just make sure everybody can hear everybody in light of multiple locations. So try to use the raise hand feature, but we will uh, start with uh, housekeeping. <laughs> If you don't know, maybe put yourself on mute. There we go. Great, thanks. Um, Kim, are you doing um, the housekeeping or? Sorry, who's doing the housekeeping? I'm sorry, we're not. We're sorry, I, I can do it. Oh, thanks. Um, welcome, welcome, committee members, liaisons, and the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and an effective meeting. If you'd like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate discussions. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. All LSTFC and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the state bar website. Zoom captioning is available. To enable, select live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen then select enable auto transcription. Okay. Thanks, uh, Michael. Appreciate it. Let's take roll. Okay. roll call. Um, Schreiber? Here. Al Saraf? Al Saraf? Connolly? Here. Al Blogi? Yes. Ball? Here. Pipemaster? Here. Blakemore? Here. O'Shelley? Here. Campbell? Here. Escobedo? Here. Gawkin? Iskin? Here. King? Here. Klein? Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Here. Meeker? Here. Milram? Here. Morales? Morales? Vargas? Just, uh, Justice Rodriguez? Here. Judge Seligman? Judge Yang? Um, I'll do our liaisons. Um, so Linda's here from RAD. Melanie, or Laura, are you on? I see Melanie. Yes. Yeah, Laura. Oh, Brooks. Okay. And Laura, okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the State Bar staff, Elizabeth, Brady, and uh, Crystal, and then the LA team. Okay, great. So I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, we have a consent calendar today. It, rather than take public comment right now, I think what we'll do is just allow public comment throughout the agenda. Um, my plan is to sort of take a break um, after section four and then come back for the conclusion um, of the meeting for five and six. We've organized it a little bit differently, but this first, uh, this first uh, item on the agenda number three is our consent calendar. So the first question for the group is whether Anybody wants to pull anything off the consent calendar? And if not, then we'll go ahead and entertain a motion to have the consent calendar approved. And it is those items that were in your agenda packets. Okay. Hearing no desire to take anything off the consent calendar, uh, do I have a motion to approve? Consent. So move. Thank you, patience. Second. Thanks, Gorshay. Okay, let's take roll. Ablagi? Yes. Paul? Yes. Whitemaster? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. 
Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Balkin? Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Yes. Vargas? Asaraf? Connolly? Yes. Driver? Yes. Motion passes. All right, thank you. Uh, as you can see from the agenda, we have a lot of items to work through today. Um, and we'll start at 4.1, which is this, is this next stretch is going to be a series of presentations. Again, I'll just remind everybody if there is any member of the public that's interested in speaking during um, at the at the beginning of each of these items, go ahead and raise your hand or use the raise your hand feature and uh, we'll recognize you. So the first item there is uh, 4.1, uh, Erica and Catherine. So um, item 4.1 is 2024 IL to EIS eligibility determinations. Um, the chair of the eligibility and budget review committee is Catherine Blakemore. Um, the committee is ready to Is that Chris? Yeah. Chris, you down in LA? Chris is yeah. in LA. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Erica. No, no problem. Um, so the committee met this morning to um, discuss the outcome of application review, which has been ongoing for about the past three months um, since applications were due on May 15th. Um, this year, we received 110 applications for IELTS and EIF funding in 2024. Um, 100 of those applicants are returning grantees. Um, 10 of them were new, so that's a substantial increase in new applicants that we've received. Um, in terms of the breakdown between types of grantees, we saw 89 legal services projects and 21 support centers. So all of those uh, new applicants fall into the legal services project um, category. Um, of the 10 new applicants, about seven of that cohort primarily um, engage in immigration legal services, um, but we also saw applicants who provide um, elder law assistance, uh, veterans legal services, and workers' rights assistance. Um, and in addition to our new applicants, um, some of the other things that stood out during application review this year was we had an eligibility review conference with the Coalition of California Welfare Rights Organizations um, regarding their internal and quality controls. Um, the, uh, the outcome of, of that conference and the recommendation from the committee is to find that organization eligible for funding in 2024, but contingent on um, complying with several conditions, including things like uh, participating in a follow-up monitoring visit next year. They had a monitoring visit this year, but they would have another one in 2024, um, requiring submission of complete, accurate, and timely reports for all of their grants. Um, complying with a corrective action plan, which is part of their homelessness prevention funding um, that is particular to their homelessness prevention funding um, and some issues that were identified there. Um, appropriately responding to their monitoring visit report findings. Uh, again, complete and accurate submission of their, their next application, including a timely audit. Um, and then some recommendations to that organization to um, improve communication with their board, um, seek uh, a board member who has um, a financial background to assist them with some of their deficiencies in that area and hiring a part-time or full-time accountant or bookkeeper. So um, there was a lot of um, sort of an in-depth uh, review um, of that organization's activities. And so that's the, the recommendation is to find them eligible but contingent on compliance with all of those pieces for next year. Um, and then the other thing that, that came up um, at the committee level was that there were two sports centers that also had recent monitoring visits, um, legal services for prisoners with children and youth law center that um, staff identified some potentially non qualifying activities. Um, but due to the recency of the monitoring visits, we're still working with those organizations to fully sort of tease out what um, the extent of those activities are. 
And so um, given the need to make determinations, uh, the recommendation is to, to find those organizations eligible for funding contingent on their continued work with, with staff to sort out um, what their non-qualified expenditures are. Um, an important thing to note related to that is sports centers, it's not going to impact their allocation. So under the funding formula, all uh, support centers receive the same allocation, no matter what their qualified expenditures are. And so that's why this is a little bit less of a concern at this present moment, um, but staff thinks we can take the time to work with them to sort that out, but would still recommend their eligibility. And that was something that the committee agreed with um, as well. Um, so as I said, the recommendation from staff and the committee was to find all applicants eligible with those contingencies that we previously mentioned. Uh, next steps are the determination here at the commission. And then within the next couple of weeks, staff would run the funding formula, uh, send out tentative allocations, and then also release budget forms that would be due at the end of September. Yes. Um, on the, I just have a couple of questions about mm -hmm. the welfare right, California welfare rights organization. So I assume the findings, they came up from a monitoring visit that we did, or is this subject to an audit or both? Yes, um, so it was part of our regular really scheduled monitoring visit in 2023, and then they also, for their homelessness prevention funds, they had a desk audit um, okay. review conducted. And so it was sort of an amalgamation of um, that, as well as some challenges they've had in uh, timely and complete materials throughout the year um, that we've been working with them on. My other question on relatedly is when you say it's so they will be deemed eligible contingent upon their compliance with this. Um you know, like, to know that we're having technical um, we're having just so everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I just <laughs> was stopping because I can you actual reaction interruption. <laughs> can you can you hear us okay in LA? Now you're, yeah, you're muted. Oh, is there is there sound currently? Uh huh. Oh, can you hear us now? They, they don't have sound. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, about that. you cut out. Um, we were having technical difficulties, but we can hear you now. Okay. One ongoing concern might be that our voice will trigger your mic and mute. Uh, sorry, will tr will trigger your speaker and mute your mic. So we'll have to be pretty quiet collectively to hear you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just, I, I just, these are just questions for my information, but just mm -hmm. like when you say contingent on, is the expectation that there will be some kind of, you know, benchmarks that they, that will sort of monitor to make sure they're actually complying with their corrective mm -hmm. action plan and stuff? And what, what is sort of the, expectation of that. Yeah, they've actually already had certain um, deliverables related to their corrective action plan yeah. that they've had to send in. And my understanding is there there was partial compliance, but we're working with them on um, some additional open uh, items. But but that is part of it. There has been laid out also as part of their monitoring visit findings, which they will need to respond to. They have not yet. Um, okay. It's not due yet. It's, they're not. Right. Yeah. Um, but yes, that we would have those, uh, the additional documentation or the additional ability to follow up with them if we felt that the information they provided was insufficient. And so it'll, you'll see as part of the motion, if they're eligible contingent on their compliance, meaning that the commission could revisit this at some point during the year if they failed you know, to, to comply with their corrective action plan and or monitoring visit findings or any other of uh, the grant requirements. So my I only, I think this is fine. I, I, I query whether it would actually be a shift in their eligibility finding versus like a finding that they were not in compliance with the grant agreement, but I'm not sure that that makes a difference, um, but that's fine. I was just curious. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, any questions in LA? You good? Okay. Catherine, anything? No, thank you. I, did, I expressed previously my appreciation to the staff who reviewed all of the applications, and um, I think it's terrific. We have um, 10 additional grantees, so that's all I would add. Super exciting. 
Yeah, I, I agree. That's a, a real uh, a genuine uptick. The other thing I, I would just note for the new members is eligibility and budget is where a lot of the important action occurs. And so if you're, if you wondered what happened there, I, I recommend you, you reach out because I think it is a place where a lot of interesting issues arise, policy decisions, as well as a lot of the oversight um, that the commission does. So anyway, I appreciate, I'll echo Catherine, appreciate staff. It's, it's a lot of work and important work. So thank you. Okay. Next page, I think, is our, we have the resolution. And I'm happy to read this if that would be helpful. Uh, let me ask, go ahead and indicate if you'd like to have this read into the record or if it's sufficient for people to, to review it on the screen and on the agenda that was posted. Okay. Let's not read it. I don't need yeah. it to be read. <laughs> So then what we will, so you'll see there are a couple of different elements of it. And I just make sure I'll give, you know, a few seconds here for everybody to read it and then entertain a motion to adopt the resolution. Okay. Catherine moves the resolution. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Aguagi? Yes. All? Yes. Whitemaster? Yes. Blakemore? Yes, abstaining as to Disability Rights California, and I hadn't asked in time whether I needed to abstain from, there's actually only two innovation and infrastructure grants, the Access Commission administers, so I'll abstain from El Otro Lado and Immigrant Legal Defenders. Uh, pending a determination of whether I need to do that, but in the meantime. We'll, we'll check on that, Catherine, but we'll know, we'll know what it is. Thanks. Um, Bashelli? Yes, and I'm staying from LASSB, uh, Inland Empire, Legal Aid, and ICLS. Thank you. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Iskin? Yes, I'm staying. I assume Bayetic is one of the applicants. If it's so, I'll abstain on that. But otherwise, yes. Thank you. King? Yes, and abstain from slow laugh. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes, staying with the law center. Hillrod? Yes, abstain as to Central California Legal Services. Morales? Yes. Vargas, Asaraf, Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Uh, yes, staying as to the impact. Um, motion passes. Yeah, thanks to the EVNR committee. Yeah. That's hard, hard work at this time of year. Yeah, is it plus 10, 10 new applicants? That's, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Immigration groups. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, four point two. Um, Still, let's let's uh, you know drop the needle on the remix here, Catherine and Erica. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, four point two is uh, related to twenty twenty four ILTAF pro bono allocation eligibility, um, which was also something that was reviewed by the eligibility and review uh, budget and review committee um, this cycle. So. Um, if you're not familiar, the pro bono allocation um, is part of the statute, but a legal services project that has as its uh, you know, primary means of service delivery or principal means of service delivery is through pro bono attorneys, they can apply for additional funding in the counties where they operate. So 10% of the funding in every county is set aside for these organizations. And those that are eligible will receive funding on a pro rata basis um, based on their qualified expenditures. So. Um, there's sort of a two part test currently um, for uh, eligibility for to receive the allocation. Um, one is that they have to show they recruit a substantial number of attorneys um, in each county where they operate. And so that test is that they have to demonstrate they recruited 30 attorneys or 5% of the attorneys in the county 
or a minimum of a thousand donated legal services hours um, in order to, to meet that initial test. Historically, that's been treated as sort of a bright line test. So if an organization can't um, can't meet that in a particular county, then they would um, sort of automatically be deemed ineligible for the allocation in that county. Um, and then if they, they meet that test, though, they can move on to demonstrating that their principal means of service delivery um, is through pro bonos. And there's uh, three tests under which they could do that. Um, two of them are quantitative. The first one is we call test A. It's very straightforward. Just if they have more volunteer attorney time than staff attorney time in the prior year, that their eligibility is presumed um, for the allocation. Um, test B is a little more complicated. If they, they can't show more attorney time than um, volunteer attorney time than staff attorney time, they can show that there's more volunteer time overall when you, you include um, paralegals in the calculation, but they would still need to have more than half of their donated time from attorneys, so there's still an emphasis on pro bono attorney involvement. Um, if an organization can meet that test, their eligibility is also presumed. Um, and then if, if they can't meet either of those, uh, test C is the opportunity for programs to provide a narrative explanation as to how pro bono is their principal means of service delivery. Um, and it's those that are applying under test C that require committee review and recommendation. Um, so this year, um, sorry, there's typo, I should say 2024, we had um, 19 total applicants for the pro bono allocation. Um, nine of those organizations qualified under test A and or B, and then 11 needed to submit narratives. Um, the reason that adds up to more than 19 is one organization qualified under test A and B in almost every county except for one. So they, um, they had to submit a narrative for Sacramento County where they operate, uh, which was Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, so this is just showing you the organizations that qualified under tests A and or and or B. Um, you can see most organizations it um, rely on test A if they meet one of the quantitative tests. There were only two organizations that needed to rely on test B. Um, and then um, this is the list of, of test C applicants. Um, but the committee reviewed all of the test C narratives um, and discussed it at length at their, their meeting back in July. Um, and recommended uh, most of these applicants for the allocation. The only two they did not um, was Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, which is an organization that has not historically received the pro bono allocation, so they've never qualified for the allocation under a quantitative test. Um, and the committee just uh, simply didn't find their narrative compelling enough to, to demonstrate that it's their principal means of service delivery. They did demonstrate that pro bono is important to their organization, but not sort of their, um, their primary service delivery method. Um, and then the other organization was Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Um, they did not recommend them as eligible in Riverside County because they didn't meet the substantial numbers test, that sort of bright line threshold. They hadn't recruited enough attorneys or donated attorney time um, to qualify, but they do qualify in San Bernardino County. So, so the recommendation for that organization is eligible in San Bernardino, but not in Riverside. Um, so those are the only two organizations that the committee had recommended against uh, giving the allocation um, in those counties, but um, otherwise of the 19 applicants, they recommended them as eligible. Um, are there counties where anybody gets 5% of the attorneys? <laughs> um, I think that's probably, I would assume, for more of the rural <laughs> counties, but I don't, I don't know. Um, if we've had to actually do the calculation for most of them, because they usually either exceed the 30 attorneys or a thousand yeah. hours. So, yeah. <laughs> the steppers are disparate 30 or yeah. <laughs> 15,000. Okay. Um, so, we have a resolution on the screen. First of all, let me just ask if there are any questions in Los Angeles. Any questions on the board for Zoom? Any questions in San Francisco? Yeah, go for it. Yes. Yeah, I'm the one who was always covering that. Do you have any sense of the breakdown of whether they're who qualified under A, B, or C on the second step? Yeah. If, if not, that's mm -hmm. fine. I was just curious. Um, you mean this? Um, this is test A and B. The applicants who qualified under test A and B. Okay. Um, Within B, you mean? 
No, sorry. After you get to B, there's like A, B, and C. The no. C is the next slide. C is the next slide. Okay. Just you want substantial numbers and then it's primary. Right. So you have to meet the threshold. So it's the threshold. Yeah. If yeah. You so don't the threshold is, with C. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. So it's about half, would you say, yes. are under test C? Yeah. And then can you go back to A and B? I'm just curious. So most of them who meet test A also, or who meet test B also meet test A. Yeah, I think only two of the nine that met one of the quantitative tests required the test B okay. option. And then for most of them that met the substantial numbers, was it by virtue of the hours, by virtue of the number of attorneys? And um, like, what's the... I think in most cases it was the number of attorneys, but um, probably some of the more rural programs um, required maybe the thousand hours um, requirement. Um, but I would say in probably the majority of the cases, they, they met both. Um, you only have to meet one of those three. So, right, yeah, 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 I'm just curious. So was there anyone that met only the thousand hours, but not the 30 attorneys? Um, I think Riverside Legal Aid, maybe, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't say for sure, but I, I want to say Riverside Legal Aid was one of them. Um, and then Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino may have also been one of them for where they did qualify, which was San Bernardino County. Okay. The only reason I'm asking this is we're, we're dealing with the pro bono allocation and like proposed role. So while I have you guys, I'm just curious a little bit about the stats on these things to see kind of what has been our... And we, and we can get more information on this in the proposal committee, but I'm just curious what, what, what's been the trends. Um, so thank you for answering my silly stats questions. Um, I, I don't have anything else. Okay, LA, can you hear us okay? <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, I think we... Hey, I was just gonna comment um, that there's a very detailed memo in the eligibility and budget review uh, with the analysis of that. And I think it's, it would still be posted online if you want um, greater detail about that from the meeting, not not today, but the one before that. Oh, it's the one prior. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Selena? Just a, a, as a comment for the newer commissioners who, who to understand how why the pro bono allocation is so important is that organizations can use a higher income threshold so they don't have to back out as many clients who are over income. Um, so it does make a difference in counties where they serve clients who they consider low income, but maybe over the 200% of poverty. Um, so it does help with, you know, protecting your future IOLTA award. And so what we've seen at LAC is that when an organization loses their pro bono allocation, they start saying, why are we, why are we backing out so many expenditures? And so we try to do a little technical assistance. And I don't think we've had a problem with like experienced organizations, but I think if some of the newer organizations get pro bono allocation, they're gonna be in there kind of on the threshold, they may need to understand why it's so important to be very good about recruiting pro bono attorneys. Because if they lose them, then they've got to back out more expenses. That's a very um, interesting point. Yeah, yeah thanks. So the only caveat to that, because we did raise the income threshold yes. from one yeah. to another, so the, the gulf is not as large anymore that, that it used to be. In some counties, that's just very close. Right? Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. almost equivalent to 200% yeah. in some some counties, but in others like Alameda and Los Angeles, it's much higher than the federal poverty level. And so I do want to note, because Erica um, talked about like um, this uh, issue of like the pro bono test is before the rules committee. And this test is not usually easy to understand because A, B, C, what is A, what is B? So the Rules Committee is working on that. Um, part of the, uh, I think the challenge is that um, having a test that would apply for both urban and rural counties doesn't seem workable. So I, what I think the Rules Committee is still going to move forward with the proposal, but we are planning to do kind of more of a landscape analysis on like the state of pro bono generally and then really focused on rural and how, how the delivery uh, pro bono is different in rural areas. Um, so and we've talked to a couple programs and um, they feel like that's valuable. That'll be informative for like the commission and programs to do some more to come on that. Great. And, and it seems to me like the relationship between the number of attorneys and the number of hours is also relevant for consideration because one attorney spending 500 hours on a single case is not really the yeah. spirit of the law, so to speak. Um, 
They're hitting well, on the exact issue. Yeah. 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 The exact issue we came, we, yeah. we stumbled upon is that, that that's, it's sort of already possible, but how do we address that in a future yeah. rule? Because that's why I'm kind of curious the sort of numbers of attorneys versus who hit the thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay, there's a resolution on the screen. Catherine, anything else from you? No, thank you for asking. Okay, um, there's a resolution. I will, assuming there's no more discussion and I don't see any, um, go ahead with the motion. Some brave soul here. Thank you, patience. Is there a second? Seconds. Thank you, Catherine. Aguagi? Yes. Paul? Yes. Fight Master? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Shelley? Yes, with the same abstentions. Thank you. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Escobedo? Yes. Calkin? Iskin? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, King? Yes. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Speaker? Yes, of State the Law Center. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Yes. Vargas? Al Sarah? Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Thank right. you again to that committee for yeah. work on this. <laughs> uh, okay, we're back again introducing a new topic. Assuming there's no public comment um, at the outset, um, this is Chris and I, Chris and me, RIP mom, uh, and Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you. First, uh, so the, uh, yeah, good afternoon everybody. Uh, the uh, 4.3 is uh, to approve recommendations for 2023 Care Court Grants, and this is coming to you from the Care Court Grants Committee. Uh, I've presented on the statutory background a couple of times, so I'm actually not gonna present these slides in their entirety. I think you probably remember most of it. I will just refresh your memories that uh, Care Court program is a new program in California. It's launching in just eight counties. Uh, and while that number is small, those counties cover about half the state. Uh, but, so they're listed here in the second bullet point. Flynn, Orange, Riverside, San Diego, San Francisco, Stanislaus Tuolumne, and also LA. The first seven go uh, starting on October 1st of this year. LA is gonna launch its care court program um, by December 1st, and then the rest of California goes at the end of 2024. The Budget Act of 2023, which uh, became law at the end of June, funds qualified legal services projects, public defenders, and support centers uh, to participate in care court. Fearless P's and PD's would get funding to represent respondents. Support centers would get funding to provide technical assistance uh, to respondents' counsel. It provided at least, it provides at least $20,400,000 for respondent representation. So that would be for qualified legal services projects and public defenders, a little over a million for support centers. It provides $1,430,000 for the cost of the agency cost of administering these grants. Um, an update since the last time we presented to you is there is, as usual, a bill that would make some changes to the Budget Act. It's Senate Bill 102. It makes a technical correction to the funding provisions for support centers in care court. It would um, um, correct a reference to them providing legal representation to them providing legal training and technical assistance. And that's the role that's actually outlined for them in the CARE Act. Okay, so in March of this year, the Full Legal Services Trust Fund Commission delegated to it the new Care Court Grants Committee authority to put an application. Oh, sorry, I was somebody was okay. Uh, there was a little noise. I thought maybe somebody was trying to ask a question. Um, authority to design the application, um, uh, and if consistent with the Budget Act, uh, create a scoring rubric that would include reporting requirements, um, or excuse me, an RFP that would include a scoring rubric, reporting requirements, et cetera. Um, indeed, the Budget Act of 2023 did create competitive grants, so the Care Court Grants Committee did 
create an RFP, including a scoring rubric. Um, I'll highlight for you before presenting this committee's recommendations for funding that the RFP uh, and scoring rubric um, uh, uh, sought proposals that would describe applicants' abilities, specifically their qualifications and their organizational capacity to provide the qualified legal services project or support center services that the applicant is seeking funding to provide. So for QLSP in particular, the RFP uh, and scoring rubric looked especially at their ability to serve adults who are experiencing a severe mental illness as defined in the CARE Act. Those are the only people who would qualify to become care for respondents. Uh, their ability to represent clients in mental health cases like LPS conservatorships or assisted outpatient treatment matters. Their ability to help clients access the types of services and supports that the CARE Act enumerates respondents can receive through their care agreements and plans, um, especially, uh, so for example, behavior health care, stabilization, medication, and housing, and then their experience litigating and negotiating because that's the general role of QLSPs and public defenders in the CARE Act. Uh, I won't read the whole squaring rubric, it's in the posted materials, but a lot of that was bundled up into the first, uh, the second row qualifications. Project impact and strategies also looked at sort of like how much work they would do. Administration kind of got an organizational capacity to manage this grant safely and effectively. And then um, uh, the, um, the committee looked at, uh, and the scoring team looked at project evaluation descriptions. So the state bar received uh, applications from three QLSPs. Uh, two applied to serve only San Francisco County. They could have applied to serve for more than one, but they, they're based in San Francisco. They sought to serve respondents only there for 23-24. One applied to serve Stanislaus County only, but later withdrew its application and expressed interest in maybe applying next year. No support centers applied. Given the short timeline for review, the full commission had authorized a commissioner staff team to score applications in consultation with the committee and to bring the recommendations for awards back to the full commission. The scoring team consisted of two committee members and two state bar staff members. The team arrived at a rounded average score for each row of the rubric and gave itself a minimum score for it to recommend funding to the committee. Uh, I won't read this whole slide because it actually overlaps quite a bit with the one that described the RFP, except to emphasize that the scoring team, I didn't pay attention to a lot of things, but because this was the inaugural year for the care court program and because the respondents are an especially vulnerable um, um, community, the scoring team paid extra attention to the applicants, the strength of their narratives um, um, uh, and to what extent they demonstrated their ability to serve this particular population of adults with severe mental health issues um, effectively and their readiness to start doing so by October 1st for seven of the counties, December 1st for LA, but uh, no one applied for LA. So the four, the little, the sub bullet points were, were basically from the RFP. Um, and the scoring team also um, talked uh, uh, at an extra extent about the efficacy of each proposal's supervision, its staffing, like its mix of new staff versus sort of staff who are already there and have experience, um, and its overall mix of strategies, including partnerships with relevant local stakeholders, use of uh, other legal professionals like social workers to, to maximize positive legal outcomes, et cetera. The um, scoring team recommended to the committee and then the committee recommends to the full commission uh, that the two applicants uh, uh, who applied to serve San Francisco, that's legal assistance to the elderly in Justice and Diversity Center of the Bar Association of San Francisco, receive an award. Um, their scores are here. They're above, well above the sort of score floor the scoring team had set for itself. Um, as a reminder, the rubric was out of 80 points. Um, so the scores were 71 and 69. The committee recommends funding both at the full amounts that they requested, uh, both applied to serve San Francisco only, and in assessing their funding requests, the committee considered and the scoring team considered the funding that was available to serve uh, respondents there. Um, so before any potential reallocation of um, funding that was set aside for support centers to go towards representation for respondents, the initial allocation for San Francisco was about $1.2 million expecting about 161 cases. That comes out to be about $7,643 per estimated case. 
Um, and both of those proposals landed around there. Both would seek to serve, uh, to represent 50 care court respondents this year, this nine, upcoming nine month period. Um, and, and the cost, the estimated costs per case in the budgets was about what is available in San Francisco County. So the committee recommends giving them their full ask. So two more slides and then, or one more slide and then the resolution and questions. Uh, so no support centers applied. So currently the budget X says that any funding left over and support centers had $1,020,000 set aside for technical assistance. The current, currently the budget says if there's any funding left over from the support centers it should go to rep respondent representation. So that would be QLSPs and public defenders. This table is simply showing how each county's allocation for respondent representation would change. Um, if the, the support center funding were run back through the same formula and reallocated. Um, and most counties would go up a little bit. San Francisco, or Los Angeles has about half the, the eight county cohort population. So it gets about half of that. Um, it also shows how much would go to each public defender office. So if the commission agrees with the committee and makes awards to JDC and LAE at their full asks, $752,095 that would go to QLSP serving San Francisco. The remainder would go to San Francisco's public defender's office. And then for the other counties, it's the entire county allocation that would go to the PD's office. Um, I did wanna flag, this is not in uh, Senate Bill 102, which is the bill that would make the technical correction to the Budget Act for support centers. But um, I wanna flag that our office has had it had been part, um, participants in conversations with the Judicial Council and Department of Finance about whether it would be good public policy for some or all of that 1 million 20 thousand that was set aside for training and technical assistance towards PDs and QSPs and what is the first year of a brand new court program. If some of that were to still go towards technical assistance and training to maximize positive in, in uh, sensitive services and positive outcomes for respondents. There's no um, um, uh, like draft language in the, the, the budget um, amendment bill at this time, but I just wanted to flag it for the full commission. If something like that happens, you, you kind of like had a heads up. Um, I don't know if Rocio or Dawn would wanted to add anything to that, but there's no there's no like language to put on the slide for you. Yeah, there, there's nothing to share with you, but because we have been in, um... I would say kind of robust conversation with DUF. Um, we have advanced an amendment um, to, to, to fix with the support of with um, the Judicial Council um, to give the commission kind of discretion since there is not a support center that um, that applied uh, discretion to contract with a provider that could provide that support services. Um, and the background is um, when we first drafted, and this is a section that we helped draft in advance uh, um, in, in consultation with the Judicial, Judicial Council, we thought that there would be more QSPs that would apply and thus more support centers. Now that's kind of flipped, um, that there are more um, public defenders than there are QSPs. And some of these public defenders office, um, we weren't actually, um, didn't realize this, and myself included, um, with some of these small public defenders office, um, they don't actually have a public defenders office, that work gets contracted out. Um, and so with it being rural areas, uh, our concern was if it's contracted out, it might not be to an attorney um, that has that support. So we do want to provide some support now that that's happening. Um, and so that would just give commission ability to contract that work out. Um, and so we think it's a, it would be a good fix. It wouldn't mean, it would not, um, how we drafted it, it would not require you to say, um, to shoot a, a million dollars out if there was another provider, it would just allow you the discretion to. Um, and so we think it's a good a good fix. Um, Department of Finance was very appreciative of our, our suggestion. Um, they're trying to think about whether it's workable. Um, that's the one thing I think uh, policy-wide, they, they seem to be on page, um, the technical aspect of it going to a non to funded organization, they're working through that, so. And it would require a change to the Budget Act uh, to do this, because the budget currently is very specific about the leftover funding. So this table does show you that Setters Paribus, if nothing changes, this is what the current Budget Act would have happened. And I added to the title of the table, tentative updated funding, just in case that changes. But this is an FYI piece. Yeah. Well, I mean, plan. We, yeah, Eric. We can't hear you, Eric. I can. You want me to say that? Yeah. So Eric, uh, Eric observed that both Glen County and Tuolumne County uh, would stay at sixty thousand dollars 
uh, to represent respondents even after reallocating funding for support centers. And uh, that's because the, the formula sets a funding floor for each county of $60,000. Uh, the first step in the formula is to allocate the pot according to their share of the eight county general population. And then it says if they're under $60,000, it raises them to $60,000 and then makes proportional adjustments. They would still be under the floor even after. Yeah, very so, good. Idea. So just to reacting to uh, Duan's comment and Chris, you and or Rocio or Duan might know, but so is the the idea of contracting in a rural county, for example, like Glen, that's using um, private attorneys uh, for public defender work, would would the public defender have the ability to provide a contract for purposes of paying for technical assistance? No, we we would be we would contract with a provider. We actually have been in conversation with a quasi government. I, I don't know if I want to call them quasi, but they, they are some what government agency, maybe they're they're totally a government agency that actually this is what they do. Um, and so this is what kind of spawned um, the, the idea. But the, the contract would be with us, the state bar, um, with this other agency to provide the technical assistance um, trainings and support services to, but we, if we were going down this route, what would we require them to provide it with all public defenders offices? So even the ones that didn't need it, we would open it up to them and plus our QSPs because there's not a support center now that's that we are providing a war to. Well, I guess. Oh, sorry. Go well, ahead. well the, the, I'm wondering, maybe this is part B of the same question, which is this in order to ensure that the $60,000 is not fall for the public defenders who are ultimately not providing the services, are the public defenders ending, because they, they have a contract to pay a private attorney to act as the public defender, just wondering if that $60,000 will ultimately be diminished by the cost of the um, the technical assistance. No, no, because that that's coming out of that million dollars. If you go back to the budget act, yeah, no, that's no, the million dollars that's okay. saved for the support center. It doesn't cut into the the sixty thousand dollars. That's for the the care port representation itself. I mean, so, Rocio, Chris, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on that, but so the idea would be is like rather than having the support centers, you'd sort of essentially hire like a government consultant. And then have them provide statewide assistance using the million yes, bucks. Yes. But wait, whatever but needs. It. I don't think it's going to be anywhere in a million dollars. It's just just the work. No, no, no. But I mean, that yeah, that, yeah. that was where the money be yes, pulled from. Yes, that's where the money center money. Yeah. And then otherwise, the PD's offices will just get the initial yeah. allocation, and then from that they can decide how to use it. Not how to use it. Do they have to like report to us like qualified expenditures, oh, so all that stuff? This, this is a really good point, and Rocio and Chris should elaborate because what we've negotiated with the Department of Finance and the legislature, um, because this is the first time we're, we're providing grants to non IELTS mm -hmm. uh, grantees. So I do want to underscore that this is a, a, a shift for the commission and the state bar totally. to provide grants um, to a non IELTS funded organization. So what we negotiated um, it, um, is that uh, we would be collecting um, all evaluations. Um, we would have enter a rent contract, like similar, you know, to our, our other grantees. The one difference is we are not going to be monitoring for compliance, which is a big, big difference with our grantees. So what we wouldn't be doing is we wouldn't be going on a, a site visit. We wouldn't be asking them to open up their books. We wouldn't be making sure that, you know, internal controls, what we would be making sure is they've spent down the funds because there's going to be quarterly, I can't remember, it's quarterly expenditures, there's expenditures reported, and then they have to uh, report outcomes to us. And then, of course, the grant agreement will have language like can't misuse the funds, you have to use it in the way it was, but we wouldn't actually, like, again, go and monitor that. And that's, that's what we negotiated. And Rocio, Chris, I, I don't know if the, you guys want to add something. No, that was, that's right. Dawn, just, I just, just add that, um, and maybe this was part of the question about the, the Tuolumne and Glenn. Um, I think it's envisioned that if some of the money went to that organization to provide tra uh, training, they would provide training to all of the um, uh, cohorts without the Glenn and Tuolumne or, or any of them having to expend any of their existing funding. It would be that funding would go to training and they would just train all of that. Cohort. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, again, because we already been in conversation with this agency, um, 
they were very amenable to opening up their training, their support services. I was still having a conversation with them to get not just the public defender's office, but anybody that's a, a participant in our life care court. So it would include our QSPs in San Francisco, the two that are in San Francisco. So sorry, I no, 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 no. This is I know this is a field of like the award. So I, I yeah. totally acknowledge yeah. this, um, which is what we need to actually approve in our group. But just so I make I'm, I'm understanding the PD's offices, like if we give LA 10 million bucks, right, to their PD office, they're gonna report to us quarterly like how they spent the money. They're gonna report how they spent the money in and in, in their financial expenditures report. They will also report outcomes report. Um, yeah, how many cases? How many cases? So, and that's that's like that's getting designed right now. Sure. I mean, Rocio and Chris are working with judicial council on that reporting requirement. But yes, the, the the outcomes, the expenditures report, we do not go out and monitor them. Right. So yes. we don't get to play like auditor. No, we don't play auditor. We we, we don't want to because what we said is we don't have familiarity in auditing another government agency. Sure, sure. I, I yeah. I'm just trying to make sure I understand the degree of oversight that we do or do not have, and so. They all report to us, and assuming that what they said is they spent all the money on care court stuff, we, our hands are, we, we, we have done our due diligence on that matter, and we'll leave to some other entity who to audit them or whatever, false claims or whatever. There's a variety of ways in which <laughs> there's oversight on government, use of government funds or whatever. Um, although I don't, you can't really do false claims against an actual <laughs> government agency. <laughs> But whatever, the state auditor, right? It has the role of doing that. Um, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. But we're getting some paperwork. Yeah, we're getting paperwork to yeah. make sure that like services are like they'll let us know like how many clients serve, how many went through. We're coordinating all this outcomes right. data with the judicial council has a lot of outcomes data. We're a very small piece of the legal piece of it. Got there's it. like right, Melanie, I don't know if you if you want to speak more to it, but there's a lot of services outcomes that the judicial council is collecting through the courts. Perfect. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's been, it's, uh, I, I would say, um, it's been a lot of work for Rocio and Chris to kind of navigate yeah, this like, new kind of terrain and setting up this infrastructure for um, 58 counties to roll out. And, and you see, because it's majority public defender's office, it's not our QSPs. So we had to, um, you know, our grants management, we've had to beef it up to handle 58 counties. So Rocio and Chris are building that out literally right now, that infrastructure um, to handle. And technical assistance, we're gearing up for, to provide technical assistance to almost every almost every county because in this instance there's only one that's familiar with us so super exciting i think this is a great opportunity yeah. for the commission to kind of play a, an interesting new role not not that i, I agree we don't necessarily want to be auditing other government agencies but and then we have two people in la who want to chime in yeah i have a quick my understanding only the uh santa francisco had qualified legal service providers apply for the grant so they're the only ones that proposed a um, project evaluation. We're not about, we won't have evaluations for any of this other money. And how strong were those evaluations? Because based on the HP experience, generally that's the weakest part of the grant application. The, so the public defenders will also have to do reportings. And they'll be subject to the same, at this time, they'll be subject to the same reporting requirements as the QLSPs, which the CARE Court Grants Committee will be meeting to discuss in a couple of weeks what those requirements are. The um, uh, the it, the strength of the evaluation narratives and the proposals, just how they described how they would collect data and use it to refine project strategies, were, were very good. I, I I can't remember exactly what their scores were, but I don't remember them being deficient or low. Yeah, they did a good job. Yeah. And I just wanted to emphasize the point about the, the contracts. We will have contracts with. Anyone that we disperse funds to, um, we'll have our typical um, specific to care court, but our grant agreement with the QLSPs, and then a separate new contract um, with the PD office. We're totaling those counties that don't have the vendor office, uh, the county equivalent um, that will manage those funds and be responsible, as Chris mentioned, um, reporting back to us how those dollars were spent and uh, in terms of the expenditure reporting and the services and outcomes. So those those will be exactly the same. The reporting requirements will be exactly the same for QLSPs and the PD offices or government entities. Yeah. Two two quick questions. One is regarding the training and and TA. Is will will PDs as as part of their grant agreement be required? 
staff staff participate because I'm thinking of counties like LA usually are like nobody can train us we're not going to go to anything uh, so that's one and then the second is seeing that pretty much for year one the money's staying in government so no nonprofits will get any money to play any role is it the commission's role to continue to do outreach work work with the governor's office on where we could change the program to get nonprofits to apply what is or do we just sit back and default to giving PDs money every year? That's an excellent question. Oh, I was, I was, I was, I was, that was a really good question. I was, I was, I was, I was to the, obviously the, the QLSPs and support centers, if it's a good mission fit, or if they think they'll be able to spend it down, because there's a, um, a lot of um, uh, legal services organizations are experiencing recruitment challenges and retention challenges. So, it may, you know, this year it may not have made, it being a brand new court program as well, it may have not made sense uh, to apply for this grant for some providers. Uh, maybe they want to see what the program will look like so they can better assess if it's a good fit for their mission. And maybe they're also hoping they'll be able to retain more relevant talent or something. As far as what the commission's role is, um, I wouldn't opine. I think it's, yeah, maybe. It's like, <laughs> I will say a little louder, a little louder, Rosie. Just, just a reminder um, that we did have planning grants, and so we did work with um, Chris was at 18, mm -hmm. I think, or other yep. existing grantees to help think through the process. Um, very much engaged with their own county counterparts in um, assessing whether and planning whether they would apply. And so we'll continue to engage them on the staff end. Um, we actually we plan on having um, some sort of like evaluation and conversation with those two QLSPs that are providing services in this initial cohort in San Francisco to let others who may be interested of our existing grantees apply and learn about how it's working. So we'll continue on the staff end to try to facilitate that process to hopefully have additional um, applicants out the set for the second year um, to all county. Obviously, that's not something we can control, but we'll absolutely, that is part of the plan to continue engaging them. Their training are required. Oh, yes. Um, so we will we'll be able, as staff, we will offer training in terms of their requirements to us and reporting, onboarding to our platform, um, just overall um, what is expected under for the funds that we are dispersing to outside of of general training on the, um, the legal representation side of it. There are other agencies providing um, that training and hopefully if we can have um, tap into part of that million, 20,000, um, we'll also offer some of that additional training to them regarding the legal representation side of it. Um, but they won't be required as part condition of the grant. Yeah, at least not from like we're managing. Okay. The budget creates like a story that they get the funding. I I wanted to respond to your question, Efrain, too, which I think raises sort of interesting policy concerns for the commission. And I, I would say two two thoughts. We have two organizations that are sort of first into the breach. And their experience is going to be extremely influential. And because of when this program is starting, I think we're going to start to get feedback pretty quickly. So I, I do consider them to be particularly important bellwethers for the rest of the community. As you know, based on our committee discussion and then also just in the past, like there was resistance to the program from the community. Um, we weren't really involved in the design, at, and, and I think that also created some issues. And so we've been sort of an observer. So in addition to the the idea that those two organizations, JDC and uh, Legal Assistance Coalition, yeah, uh, um, I was thinking of the acronym, but it's, it was too it wasn't slipping off the tongue. Um, anyway. They'll be really influential. The, the second point I wanted to make is I really think it's important that the commission facilitate a conversation with the public defenders in an organized way, because I think it's 
possible, and I don't know if it's probable, but I think it's possible that that is the right place for the money. Um, I don't know. I don't presume to know at this stage, but I think their, their feedback, given their sort of outsized role in this first year is extremely important as well. And it may come to pass that as a hypothetical to spin out, if, if it is most effective or more effective even for public defenders, whether it's across the state or in particular areas, rural, or urban, for the public defenders to have a role here, then that's important information to communicate back to the Department of Finance because the commission is already in kind of an unusual position of administering this money. And I think it's not optimal for us to be giving money to the public defenders in this way. We're sort of doing what we've been tasked with doing by statute, but if, if the Department of Finance wants to shift that in some fashion based on the data that we collect, I think that is important for the commission to facilitate those conversations and that policy decision back to the governor's office. So that's like an ongoing role and I'm sure you will be in charge of it. If JDC has like a great experience, they prove to be really effective, then I think the commission can definitely work with Black, for example, to sort of message that out and report out how and what's working and why and what isn't, et cetera. So that might inspire year two participation in a way that we don't, we haven't seen yet. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I was just going to say um, I, a couple of things. First of all, I, as as a person that read the grants with Benetta, um, I thought these were two exceptional proposals that were really well thought out um, and appeared to have some coordination built in in discussions with the public defender's office. So it seems sort of as though they, they were working collaboratively, both the two legal services organizations and the public defender's office from the beginning. So just wanted to flag that as a reviewer of the program. I think the feedback from many legal services organizations is that their interest in doing this work is helping people access the services that are specified in their care plans and that they have less interest in representing people in care proceedings. Maybe that will change over time. I don't I don't know, but there there was litigation brought by legal services organizations and support centers about the what, what what they said was the coercive nature of the program, and that may be hard for some organizations to overcome to ever accept funding over the program. Um, so that's that's just a perspective about that. And then my question is on the technical assistance idea that uh, Duan was mentioning. Does that come back to the care committee, or how how does that become operationalized? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Rocio, have we have we thought through? I mean, I know this is fast moving the last few days. Um, that's a good question. Like, does that come back? Say, say the act changes, and then how do we operationalize that? Idea? So, I think the question we have to bring it back to the commission. I presume. I uh, I don't think the commission's March resolution delegating authority to the care grants committee would in, would uh, be inclusive of. A decision about what to do with that, you know, one million dollars as far as technical assistance goes. Uh, Catherine, I don't know how you feel about that. I feel like that probably should come back to the full commission. Oh yeah, I wasn't trying to delegate it to the committee. I'm sorry. I was just speaking as a member of the committee, saying I at least would be interested in knowing about that. I didn't. I wasn't trying to assume that the that we had the authority to make a decision. It's fine to go back to the full commission. I was just kind of thinking through yeah. who would discuss it first. I mean, we, we drew a parallel. I mean, the language in that well, that we submit, I, I can't remember exactly, but we're drawing it a parallel to another like grant award. So if we if we are consistent that it would go back to the commission unless the commission delegated to the committee. But but I, I agree with Chris, I think because this is a, a new territory um, that the full the benefit of the full commission here and 
weighing in with you. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, I really had forgotten about the delegation, so I wasn't really speaking to that, but just trying no, no, to it's, it's answer. Because that's, yeah, was our process. Thank you. All right, Chris, last slide there. All right. Thanks. So it's so short, I can read it if that's helpful, but I, okay. So the uh, proposed resolution is resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves the 2023-2024 CARE Report grant recipients and amounts as described in the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission CARE Report grant ladies memo dated August 10th, 2023. I'll, I'll make the motion. Sorry, Kate. Um, yes. Paul? Yes. Fightmaster? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Yes. Vargas? Al Saraf? Connolly? Yes. Fern? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, thank you, Chris, for all the work, Rocio. This, uh, this is new territory, so we're cutting through the thickets. Um, and you do it with a smile on your face, um, <laughs> which is pretty amazing sometimes. So thank you for that um, and all the work for it. And, and that's gonna be an ongoing issue, uh, you know, for the commission for the next several meetings. So I know that the committee had a lot of discussions. And so I, I know that they're very engaged. So thank you all. Uh, okay, for for partnership grants, any hands for public comment? Okay, take it away. Hi, Aaron. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll I'll get started. I'm just sharing screen. Um, so this is item agenda item four point four pre -rec recommendations for the 2024 partnership grants. Um, Eric will actually be taking the lead on this presentation. Okay, thanks, Crystal, uh, and thanks for the presentation. So we just have a couple of slides here. I think many of the commissioners are familiar with the Partnership Grants program. Uh, briefly, can, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yes. So as the name implies, Partnership Grants are partnerships between uh, two LSPs, nonprofits, and various superior courts around the state to provide clinics uh, for self-represented litigants to help them <clears throat> things like if they're in a divorce, a custody battle, family law issues, in other words, landlord tenant issues, um, debt relief issues, there are a couple that do small estate planning, and very, very helpful clinics. Um, and this is a uh, this is a competitive process. Not everybody who submits a grant gets one. So we uh, I think you can see from the first slide, we have 37 applications, uh, and I won't read this slide because you can see what the numbers are. We actually had, we thought we were only going to have $3.5 million to distribute based upon last year, but we had more, we actually got more than we thought, which essentially enabled us to fund virtually everything uh, with some minor shavings. So, um, <laughs> seal. Uh, we applied to the grants, uh, the kind of rubric that you we saw uh, in Chris's presentation, um, we had various dimensions there, project impact, um, and rated the project range we got on the rubric, and you can see what the average score was. The grant period for this grant, by the way, this is for 2024, so what we approved today will be distributed in 24, we've already approved 2023, we did that last year. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, we applied um, a couple of um, considerations to uh, approach the application. You can see them here. We first applied a funding cap of 
thousand dollars, which most of the projects fell well within that range. There were just a handful that were exceeding that. And the reason we provided that cap is because, um, well, actually, in prior years, the, there was a cap that was much lower than that. I think I think last year for twenty twenty three, it was like twenty five thousand. Correct me if I'm wrong something like that, but we increased the cap this year significantly and we're able to capture most projects. There were just like two or three that exceeded that amount. Um, uh, and by the way, we checked with projects, uh, those that exceeded the cap that pro provided proposals that exceeded the cap and they were all able to accomplish essentially their mission with this cap in place. So we applied this cap um, for projects who scored at least 70 points on the rubric that was below the average, we funded everything up to the cap. And we applied a bit of a shaving for projects that were below 70 points. We we're able to actually pretty much fully fund them. We funded 90% of their requested amount. And again, we checked with all of those that we proposed the shaving, and they were all able to pretty much accomplish the mission, even with this 10% cut. So we were essentially basically able to fund more or less everything. Um, and then we had, after doing all that, we had about $17,000 left over and we distributed that 17,000 to a couple of projects that exceeded the cap, highly rated projects. We just gave out the money to those, there were two projects. So that's what we did. And Crystal, do you, do you have the chart there? This is a real- Very small, but it's attachment via the um, meeting materials. <laughs> <Get that. laughs> anyway, obviously that, I guess it's not terribly helpful, but um, that, that was in the materials that were distributed. So you can see what we did. So um, that's what we did. Unless there are any questions, I'll just pause there. Crystal, if I forgot anything, or Rocio, if I forgot anything, you, you can add. But otherwise, let's move on to the resolution, which you can see here. And I don't really need to read it. We're just asking you to approve the funding that was shown on the chart. I'll let you read it for a minute and then I'll ask for a motion. Any questions from anybody? All right. Oh. Both Shelley has moved. I'll second. Thank you. Aguagi? <laughs> yes. Paul? Yes. Right, Master? Yes. Blake Moore? Yes. Rochelle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Escobedo? Sorry, your sound in LA is, is um, cutting in and out. Um, Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Yes. Vargas, Al Saraf, Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. If I'm, first of all, uh, if you could record that I'm that's the base setting. I forgot to do that. Sorry. Oh, no problem. We'll note it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just, Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the work of Crystal. Crystal I think it's rolling off this committee. She's uh, she's been the point person on it for a couple of years. Really great job. The other staff folks have done a great job, and also Mr. Boschelli is coming out of the commission, and he's been a great uh, great contributor to the committee as well. So I wanted to acknowledge his work. This, I'm, I'm emeritus on this committee. And and uh, <laughs> have a great affection for it. So I appreciate it. Thank you um, to everybody on the committee and um, staff too. Really appreciate it. Okay, uh, on to four or five. I need extensions as well for the last vote. No problem. Thanks, Jim. No, that was uh, Will. Will. Oh, that was Will. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I needed to abstain for CCLS. Well, you you know, know, what you what? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, public comment at four or five. Seeing none. Um, okay. Let's uh, go to HP3. Uh, Jennifer, where are, there you are. Hi. Okay. All right. 
So uh, this is agenda item 4.5 to approve recommendations for the 2021 slash 2022 to 2024 homelessness prevention or HP3 grant reallocation process. And I'll be presenting on behalf of myself and Jim Meeker, our esteemed outgoing chair of the Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee. Okay, so uh, we've gone over this background before, but as a refresher, the budget acts of 2021, 2022, and 2023 allocated $80 million for three years of homelessness prevention legal aid to QLSPs and support center for both formula and competitive grants known as HP3 grants. The Legal Services Trust Fund Commission made 75 formula and 23 competitive grants. Formula grants began on December 1st of 2021 and competitive grants began the following month on January 1st, 2022. All of these grants will end on December 31st, 2024. Um, and the rest of the slide discusses what the HP3 awards may fund, which we've discussed before. Uh, on March 24 of this year, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approved Public Council's budget revision request, which included reducing their HP3 formula funds from $2,600,319 to $1,433,183, and their HP3 competitive funds from $1,100,000 to 537,397. This means public council reduced their HP3 formula funds by $1,167,136, and their HP3 competitive funds by $562,603. Additionally, as of December 31st of last year, HP3 grantees left 23% or over $6 million of their first year of funds unspent. And in particular, 14 grantees spent under 50% of their grants. Staff recommended reassessing spending in the summer of 2023, so the committee and the commission could seek to reallocate funds by the end of 2023 if appropriate. The goal of reallocating some HP3 funding would be to promote their use for homelessness prevention legal aid um, because no carryovers will be allowed after the grant ends. So um, staff collected each grantee's spending projections as part of the second annual HP3 evaluation and the evaluation instructed grantees, this is a quote, to enter the amount of HP3 funding for this grant that you anticipate remaining unspent on December 31st, 2024. If you anticipate spending your entire grant, enter $0. If you enter a number that is greater than $0, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission may require your organization to reallocate that amount to other HP3 grant recipients this summer or fall. That would promote their full use of HP3 funds for homelessness prevention legal aid by the end of the grant period. Five HP3 formula grantees projected underspending uh, $889,512 combined by the end of the grant and one HP3 competitive grantee projected underspending $85,000 by the end of the grant. Staff contacted all HP3 grantees to invite them to voluntarily relinquish funds they project will not be spent by December 31st, 2024. And we have also invited the six grantees who projected underspending to either confirm or adjust their projections. If the commission were to approve the committee's recommendation, a minimum of $1,167,136 in formula funds and $562,603 in competitive funds would be available for HP3 reallocation. Uh, once again, this is the amount of funds that public council has uh, reduced their awards by, uh, but this amount could increase because of those additional um, underspending projections. So this is a reallocation timeline. Today, we're meeting for the commission to approve the reallocation process. Um, on August 14, grantees will uh, confirm the relinquished amounts for reallocation. That's both those six grantees mentioned in uh, the memo attachments A and B, as well as um, the deadline for grantees to voluntarily 
relinquish uh, for reallocation. On August 18th, eligible grantees will opt in to receive additional HP3 funds. Uh, later in August, staff will rerun the reallocation formulas with only those grantees that opted in to receive additional HP3 funds. Uh, in early September, grantees will affirm that they opt in to receive the revised funding amounts. On October 20th, the committee will recommend reallocation amounts. And then finally, on November 9th, the commission will approve the reallocation amounts. Uh, and here is the proposed resolution. I won't read it unless uh, that's preferred. Uh, I'll let everybody read it. And Jim, I don't know if you want to talk or give some thoughts about just sort of our discussion at the last committee meeting or um, anything else. Well, I thank Jennifer for the great presentation. I just want to caution, as Jennifer mentioned, these are federal COVID funds. So there is no possibility to carry over. We have to spin it down as far as possible. Uh, it's not likely we're going to get federal funds in the near future again. So that's what we really go through these efforts to expend it down to the last penny. Also, I should say this is one of the first times, at least in my experience on the, on the commission that we've had a multi-year grant process, which creates all sorts of issues in terms of terminology, what's a carryover versus a rollover, increased staff monitoring capabilities, programs aren't used to getting money to spend out this many periods of time. So I hope we take the lessons that we've learned with HP3 and apply that to any multiple year funding for IOLTA, given our big boom year for extra money. So those are the only comments we have. Uh, anybody else on the committee before I add something? Uh, the only thing I was gonna say that we talked about and this is sort of an ongoing project for the committee beyond today and staff is that when this money comes back for reallocation, there was a discussion at the committee whether the reallocation on a pro rata basis was sort of the best way to reallocate or if a particular organization was able to use a larger chunk of money to serve more people because they've been able to staff up, they've been able to identify the need, et cetera. Uh, th there was some discussion at the committee about that. Um, it, I think it turns on how much money is coming back ultimately when people reconfirm, but that's something to keep an eye on. And that was, that was what we discussed at the last committee meeting on this issue. So. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I just want to confirm, are none of the organizations are like protesting relinquishing these funds? They're used to it because it happened once before, in a way. I'll, I'll also say that um, one organization so far of the six who are listed in the attachments uh, came forward just before the HP Funds Committee meeting and said that actually they wanted to adjust their uh, number, they might not have any unspent funds, they wanted to take a little time to consider it. So as mentioned today, um, and in the memo, we have built that in. So all of those organizations now have the opportunity to finalize those amounts by August 14th. So if an organization were to come back and say, actually, we've recalculated, we will not have any unspent funds, uh, the way that this resolution is worded is they would not be obligated to give back any funds. And just to emphasize that point, um, our goal is for these funds, as Jim mentioned, to be spent down. If existing grantees can spend their entire award, wonderful. Um, the only reason we're going through this process is we have some return funds and others that may want to opt in to, to have them reallocated and spent down because they feel they may not be able to, and that would result in us having to return the funds after um, December 31st, 2024. I, I, and to answer your question, I think directly, I, I think all the organizations that have are at risk of giving back the money or having the money reallocated sort of appreciate the broader community 
issue, which is like this money goes away and if it can be deployed. So I think everybody got that and there isn't any hard feelings that I'm aware of. I think everybody was pretty understanding. Got it. So this is kind of a, a little bit of an opt-in process, right? So they get basically a chance to say, we budgeted to be understood, but now that the money might be taken away, maybe we, we want to rethink that. And if we still really don't think we can, we'll tell you we'll relinquish the funds. It's a dialogue and it's been very um, amicable. Okay. It's, 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 it's good for the community in general. And so I think programs get that. That's, you know, we'll just be redistributed to another program. So, yeah, I have no doubt that there's like good faith on the whole side. Sarah, just my only question was the way the motion was kind of phrased. It sounds like we are mandating that they return certain funds. And I just wasn't sure what our authority was for that. So that's why I wanted to make sure we were, there yeah. was no, there was going to be no face off later. Yeah, I, the one thing I would say that this underscores, in, in addition to this sort of builds on Jim's point, which is there are lessons here about multi-year grants, but among them here is like the monitoring component and the ongoing dialogue, because I think a worst case scenario would be for us to have been surprised on December 31st, 2024, that this large chunk of money was now unused. Uh, this obviously underscores also like the recruiting and retention piece because I think part of the big chunk of money that's coming back is because the program was difficult to sort of staff up and build out. So yeah, I, it's sort of a hats off to both the community and the staff to be in that in that dialogue. So anyway, all right. There's a red. Oh, go for it, Efrain. Yeah, a bunch of questions, but I've narrowed them down and prioritized them. Uh, so I think I, I'm making the assumption based on the date of when funding, when spend outs complete, that this is CARES Act and not ARPA dollars. Yeah. HP3. HP3 yeah. uh, is American Rescue Plan Act. It's, so it's, it's, it's um, Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund, which is American Rescue Plan. Okay. Um, I, I only ask that because then it's, you know, there's there's certain jurisdictions at the local level county that are actually expending out through 2025 and into 2026. So I'm curious on the 2024 and whether we've explored just extending the grants to allow for more pay, but only because, I mean, the need for this is not going down. There's a different issue going out. It's not the demand, um, which then leads to my second question, which is, in the conversations with the grantees, are we also looking at how we structured the grant agreements and whether what we are categorized allowable expenses, rates of indirect that they can book? Like, have we explored whether we're creating the limited spend down because of the categories that they could spend on? There's a lot of flexibility in ARPA dollar. So my big question is, are we looking at our vehicle to see if that's causing an issue with how they're spending and spend. And then my last, it's not really a question, but just what I hope we took into consideration is, is an equity lens and said, when we reallocate, we should not be shifting funds from areas of high need and poor communities into other areas just because they're spending faster. And so just want to make sure and would want to hear how, how that was taken care of. Excellent point and question. I think on the the one about uh, or so that was restricted or created an inability to, to spend down additional funding. Um, Jennifer and Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that we, we did that specifically for mm -hmm. HP3 um, in considering this allocation. This is brand new for our office as of mm -hmm. the HP2 allocation. Um, process that the commission approved, I believe, just last month, um, about a month and a half ago, um, due to this realizing that there's more we can do as opposed to just, you know, at the end of the day, grant close, what we have over, let's return it. They're trying to explore a little bit more how we can engage in dialogue with grantees, hear what the challenges are, and see what mechanism, mechanisms we have um, within the, the structure of our contract and, and the budget act and whatnot, uh, what flexibility we may have to administer those funds in a, in a more supportive way 
Um, so that's something that we're doing across all of our grants for HP Blue, specifically the grant, uh, the reallocation process to us seem to be the best based on what we would grantees that some just don't feel due to staffing challenges or other things, they wouldn't be able to necessarily spend these, but they know there's a need and others have told us that there is a need and they may be able to provide additional services within this time frame. use those dollars. I would just add that uh, we also, as an office, have expanded our uh, opportunities to do budget revisions, um, whereas our office previously had a deadline and reviewed those on an annual basis. We now review budget revision requests uh, when they come in and we present them periodically to the committee and commission. Um, and what that's done, along with our um, willingness to look at deliverable modifications on a rolling basis has meant that programs who might be able to spend down fun more funds if they were to expand or alter their services have been given an opportunity to do that. Um, and we've, we've um, you know, worked with many programs to ensure that they can do that as well. And I'm sorry, I didn't answer the, the, the final question around the, the equitable approach um, and, and need in assessing that. Um, for HP3, we did look at what flexibility the commission had to reallocate those funds or redistribute among existing grantees. And um, via formula seemed to be the only mechanism available, meaning if you've been found eligible and you wanna opt in, we could run the formula again and you get that amount. Um, didn't seem to be when we reviewed with the council, uh, another mechanism um, through which we would be able to do it other than potentially, you know, an additional um, RFP process where you would be able to actually look at that, but timing wise, it didn't seem that that would be a, um, a possibility given that we're, where we are in the year and that we have one final year left. But one, one of the, just to, on that last point, um, uh, eligible grantees do not have to opt in for additional reallocated funds if they can't spend them down. That Correct. Just, yeah. So the, this, this touches on the, the thing I was describing a minute ago, which is if somebody is going to get an additional $10,000 as part of a reallocation and that just is, isn't, isn't going to do anything except give somebody a raise or something, you know, they're not, there's not a, dish, a, a corollary increase in services. That's part of the dialogue that staff is going to have with these organizations as part of this um, reallocation reconfirmation process. Because I think the goal of the committee was to say, we've got this money, it's going to be reallocated. There should be some corollary benefit to the services that you're going to deliver, not just you're getting more money and doing the exact same amount of work that you had planned to do before. I, I want to just appreciate your question there, uh, the last question that you asked, and I, I think it's a really important one. I would say uh, two things about it. One is, the first thing is, I, I think a three-year grant or multi-year grant is actually an equitable grant relative to a single year grant. So I do think that moves in the direction of equity. And the reason why is because it gives an opportunity for um, programs that are, are not already at the starting line to get to the starting line over a longer period of time. And that to me, is just a, a more equitable approach. But the second thing is something that I think we struggle with in all of our grants and in all of the programs that we oversee, which is the spit and polish that an organization has that's big and established is and can put onto any grant application is not necessarily um, a reflection of where need is or where services are going to be delivered in the most meaningful way, it's it's a reflection of who has the experience and the staff already in place to put these things together. So I just want to appreciate your question because I think it underscores what our role has to be, which is to sort of take a deeper look and to say, this organization is new. We've got 10 new IOLTA grantees coming in. They're going to need 
technical assistance that um, you know is decades old for other organizations. Uh, and we need to be asking those questions. And I think staff is sort of prepared to at, at, ask those questions, but the commission and the commissioners really um, can bolster that effort. So I, I'm really grateful you raised that point. Yeah, I answer that, Chris. And and I get, I get the yeah. point The you have to use a reallocation formula. And so what I hear you saying is, even in that reallocation, you can't set parameters to that reallocation and say, prioritizing and waiting provide yeah. for these certain areas. You're saying you're, you don't have the authority to do that, which then means when you identify for the reallocation, there is a possibility that you'll shift funds away from high need communities into other organizations, or that there'll be a resulting net less amount in certain um, counties versus others. Possibly. possibly. And okay. I think that, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And something that we can, that we want to look mm -hmm. at moving forward is we yeah. think about like new funding and new mm -hmm. grant cycles. Um, and, and just to emphasize, we're definitely in dialogue with, um, with Jennifer and, and the team with organizations and LAC is also helping to communicate out like the purpose of reallocation and the connection to the services and hoping um, that the purpose of the reallocation purpose is um, to send and, down funds. And I'd like to add too though, you gotta place it in the context of the original grant allocation. Part of it was formula driven, part of it was, it was competitive. competitive grants. Mm -hmm. And in the competitive process, the committee did review and scoring these grant proposals, special needs such as rural, <laughs> special problems, special identified problematic populations like indigenous Native Americans and so on and so forth. So in the original allocation, all of those things were reconsidered. It's just that now that we have a year left, we really can't go through the competitive grant reallocation process again. We just don't have time. Yeah. And my, I guess last question, and then Chris, I promise to, to see back the floor. <laughs> With respect then back to this December 31st, 2024, is that is that by set by a contract term or by statute? And the entire state has mandated that all their ARPA funds need to be spent down by this date. These are COVID funds. And yes. Yes. Rosie, I can take that one unless you and Chris remember off the top of your head. It, it is by statute, but uh, the however is um, we did not seek uh, an amendment to that 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 statute we have in some years, we didn't want to shine a spotlight to that the fact that we could not spend it. So when this comes around again next year, um, we'll put our heads together, the judicial council and back and see um, whether we should. Yeah, I, I mean, I would recommend it only because I do appreciate that it is, but there are jurisdictions that are exercising a longer time and they do have till 2026. And so I think, you know, we're shifting money around. And to some extent, Chris, to your earlier point about impact is, there's, there's, there's shedding light on some people are not spending money. And then there's a reality of if the impact's there and we just need to give it a little bit more time, we should actually discuss that and, and explore it. Because for instance, here in LA County, they're now saying you have to 2026 to spend on your money. That's a whole two years more than what we're saying here. Yeah, I, I, will, I will flag that we did um, the, the each, sorry, Jennifer. This, I remember this coming up back in the fall when I was when I was coordinating the committee. Um, uh, the this Office of Ex Inclusion um, did consult with the Judicial Council of California team around whether or not we might be able to request because what you're describing would be like a carryover. Like, can we go past the end of the grant term, give them an extra year or something like that? And at, in the fall, late fall, early winter, I want to say November, December. Uh, we heard that it at that time wasn't possible to go to the legislature and seek a statutory change that would allow for a carry. Um, I have not heard since then, but I would be unsurprised if that was still the opinion. But um, that was that, that's actually what started the conversation about like, well, then how do we make sure that we spend now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all that. There's a resolution and a further resolution on the board. And I have a, a more pedestrian question oh, okay. that has been asked before. Um, I'm looking at the timeline. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that the programs that you need to hear from by Monday mm -hmm. are sitting by the phone to find out what we're doing. 
right? That there's, I mean, today's, it'll be Thursday afternoon and by Monday they have to tell you. So I'm assuming you've figured out like how to smooth out that timeline and make sure you don't miss anybody and nobody misses you. Um, similarly, you've got eligible grantees who've got, what is it, next Friday deadline to get back to you and say, well, if, if people are letting money go, we want it. I'm assuming, again, you line people up and we're going to get to you. The thing that I'm worried about, and I'm hearing that the reallocation process is a little more complicated than just, oh, you don't want it here, we'll do it, we'll put it here. Um, and I appreciate that, that it's a, it sounds like it's going to be a thoughtful, careful, um, appropriate process. And yikes, by the time budgets get approved, it's November 9th. 20 minutes later, it's Thanksgiving. 10 minutes later, it's Christmas. I mean, a lot, you know, and, and so assuming most of this is staff time, um, your opportunity to use it up, you know, August is gone, September is gone, October is gone, half of November is gone. So I'm wondering if there's any way, and I say this with some trepidation, because everybody already, what staff does is just beyond astonishing to me, but is there any way to condense the timeline so people like maybe October 1st programs would be able to have the approval. And I would, I would be interested if we're not gonna have another meeting and frankly, I'm sorry, I don't remember when our next meeting is, but if we're not having another meeting until November, I would delegate this decision to a committee of the, of the commission or, you know, I, I would, I think speeding up the timeline is really important. That's a good question. J Jennifer and Rocio, is there a way to truncate or speed it up? Sure, so I can go back to that slide. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the schedule for HP funds is such that our next meeting is August 31st. And then after that, the next meeting is October 20th. You, you um, can clean out the November 6th, though, if I'm hearing patients right. If you if the commission is comfortable with delegating, maybe it ends on October 20th. That that would be a recommendation, yes. Um, I heard of that the committee could scoot its meeting closer to the middle of September or, I mean, really, it seems to me the hard work is staff's work figuring out what do we recommend in terms of where the funding should go. We've got two formulas, one for the formula grant and one for the discretionary and competitive grant. So I that that's really what would be helpful to me to hear from you about is that you've got you've got grantees opting in twice, which I don't know if that's, you know, they opt in on the 18th of August and then they affirm that they opt in on September 8th. I'm wondering if that could be condensed a little bit. I hear that they should have numbers that they're committing to. I'm assuming that's the reason for the second opt-in. Yes. Um, so that work, and that seems to me that's the hard work, is like, what do we think people should be getting? Like, which program should get what? Um, and I'm just wondering why it couldn't be the next week, even if it's by that the committee meets and and does it by I don't know Zoom or well, email or let me ask just a procedural question. Can the committee approve the reallocation amounts without the full commission? You can if you delegate today. That that's yes. Well, I have no I have no objection to having the committee having the authority delegated to the committee and the committee meeting. It could even occur before October twentieth. So we don't have to be married to that date. We can just say, we can, we can entertain a motion from the commission to delegate authority to the committee to approve reallocation amounts after, October, after September 8th. And then staff and the committee can work out what date would, would work. And it would likely be before that October deadline. And, and I would, you know, this is something LAC might want to weigh in on. Um, but I, hopefully it's, it's much closer to September 8th than it will be to October 20th. If there's well, any way humanly to do that, I see Rocio like, mm -hmm. well, May everybody, every committee member is like, at, like doodle poll, right? Kind of right. thing too. So just to acknowledge like, 
It's we not all a simple matter. Right, we all volunteer and, and right. taking yeah. time off from work can yeah. help. It's not always easy, so. Right. Yeah, we're definitely, let me just say, I don't, I take the suggestion, it seems like there's general agreement. I'd leave it to staff to just say, without wedding ourselves to a date, the idea would be that within staff's bandwidth, within the committee's bandwidth, as close to September 8th as would be possible, that certainly that truncates the gap by two months right. between the current plan. Which would be huge, really. So then, yes. What's the, what's the time difference between, just related to that, between when it gets approved and when the money actually goes out the door? Excellent question. Actually, we, oh, sorry. But I would say the actual going out the door isn't actually an issue. Sometimes it's late. That that's not the programs just need the assurance, right? They don't really need the Okay, the that's what I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. It just it's, if I can just uh, really quickly, I, I love the idea of speeding up this timeline, and I think we can certainly do that to a certain extent. I would caution, though, that uh, it will likely be a few weeks after September 8th, just because um, grantees will need time to submit their final budgets, yeah. and uh, staff will need time to review those. So it it will need to be a few weeks later than September 8th. I don't I don't want to give the commission the wrong idea about the timeline. Well anything prior to November 9th is fine. I I think and obviously the more time the better. That's the idea. So let's the question I have is do we need it does the resolution need to change to add something more expressly that the commission designates or delegates to the committee the authority to approve the reallocation after September 8th. I would think so. So let's you give you another, can... another further resolved. Um, yeah. or, or, yeah. Whoever's. Yes, that's me. Yeah. The, the only thing I would say is in the, in the second graph there, the memo mm -hmm. dated August 10th, suggests that the timeline is dated. No, that's, you need the top one to revise that. This, the, 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 the middle one is about the attached, is about which organizations. So you need the top one to say, oh, right, right, the top process one, process the top to say, as described at the meeting, at the yeah. meeting. Yeah. 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 And then second one, we, there's no risk that some other organization will come in between now and next Monday and say they also have unspent funds, right? Even if they did. Well, but they're not on attachment A or B. Well, we've, just to be clear, part of the process. That's that, yes, and we've, we've messaged that to grantees at this point multiple times. Got it. And why do we even need the second paragraph? I, I, I was asking the same, I was thinking the same question. And I think that helps answer, I think, patient uh, question. And should, we have been communicating to grantees that this is coming to the commission for consideration. So to start letting us know so that they can start thinking about it and that it would be very difficult to turn, you know, turn something around and be like, yes, give me more money. Let me see how I can spend it. Um, so they have a communication plan. And we do plan on, we have it actually, Jennifer drafted an email after this commission meeting, sending something out to existing grantees to let them know the outcome of, of the, the resolution. So, so Jennifer, I think it reads um, that the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission delegates authority to the committee to approve reallocation awards. So this is Catherine. I, I agree with this approach. I think it would just help me to be clear. I, I was very, um, I thought Efrain's comments were really well taken about this longer time period. And what I heard staff say is you didn't want to ask earlier whether it was appropriate to explain extend the timeline is there still the opportunity in the remaining 30-day session that begins on monday to ask for an extension that might address talk to melanie and judicial council i think when we explored this um it was a it was a strategy decision it was collective decision last judicial council and state bar to not again like shine a light that we could not spend money when we're you know moving into the budget years so forth but um um can, can we can like council and black and us consult on that and we should also yeah, you can i i just feel like that allows opportunities to address the concerns that were raised in addition to 
into this approach and I think it might be possible to get an extension so the only I mean I, I don't know if we you have a ballpark number and, and um you and Jennifer have a ballpark because I think all, that also makes a difference right if it's like a lot then it might be worth it if it's if it's a map that we can actually spend I, I would say as a strategy it's better to try to spend it um but yeah, yeah number. I don't know if you have a we do. It's the number that Jennifer shared. It's a million. Um, I think it's like eighty-five thousand for from the competitive and something for us. Off the top of my head, yeah, it, it, it's in one of the slides. We can go back to it. So at the moment, we think the reallocation process would allow for the spend down based on what we're hearing for the remainder. But I think at the same time, we can also explore the potential for extending past twenty twenty four. Um, so if, if if at the end of if we move forward with the reallocation process as proposed and there's still concerns about spending down just to see if we have that option. So I, I, I think that would be great because there's something about being able to show the money was well spent, right? And to achieve good outcomes, which I agree with patients, like the more truncated the time is. And honestly, I think at best, we're going to be talking about October, you know, three months like it just makes sense with the reallocation to try and get some additional time and hopefully be able to target some of the communities that Fran was uh, talking about. So I appreciate you doing that. Again, I I, I want to underscore the point that Dwan made though, no, is that we we don't want to give the impression that we have too much money. It's fifteen months, just to be clear. There, not three. Thank you. Well, that's why I said for next, unless I'm getting, getting the dates wrong, and I could be, I have a lot, there's a lot of grants going on. Rasu, can you, can you help clarify? Um, it's the end of 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Why are you yeah. stressing so much? I was yeah. like, they have a year already. Yeah. 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 Very good point. So that's why I think for the next year. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is why, <laughs> sorry, my brain is too. That's great to spend over 15 months instead of. Right. 13 months, right. but it's well, not we, like it's, 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 we had this time for this, this legislative cycle to do a pass. Yeah. 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 There's various pieces, right? Um, so if, if that timeline's right, Rocio and Jennifer, you guys check us, but we're going to revisit next, next year, right? They have 15 months to spend. They're That's not going to spend end of this year. Correct. Okay. It's very okay. different. Okay. The conversation. Francisco. Okay. In my recollection, this has been a while, Chris may remember better, is that there's different tranches of funding. And so some of them it may toll more quickly than others. And my understanding is that funding that went to uh, counties and cities, this very complicated thing, may have a different time that they may be spent by. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, we have to track it back to the, yeah. the funding stream. That, that is correct. And Chris and Rocio might remember off the top of their head, but um, there's some that's flexible and some that's not. But in any ways, you would still require to like a, a, a statutory fix for it. So we need to know what's a hard deadline and what's like, yeah. But is there, but there's in no circumstances the deadline before 20, December 31st, 2024. No, it's 2024, yes. Got it. So there's at least a year that they can send this down and then we can have a further discussion about the degree to which we, we can and should request yes. an extension beyond that. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know if this changes anyone's opinion about delegating authority to the committee one way or the other, but. I mean, I think it still makes sense to like, the faster it gets out, the more time they have. I don't have a problem with that. I just don't know that we need like, right. need to totally upend everybody's like right. schedule yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, is all. I think yeah. even shaving it off and cutting out, like it, if you all feel comfortable, that feels efficient. It seems like it's fairly formulaic. Yeah. And then also that keeps, um, we, we can have more of these higher level policy discussions at the commission meetings, right? Yeah. you know, and let the committee who knows what they're doing yeah. kind of. Right. Well, I think the committee has that. good direction from today's meeting as well. So, can I, yeah. yeah, can I just make one suggestion on, on the resolution? The first sentence of the second paragraph, I think you should just take that out and just because if you don't, if A and B, the attachments in A and B, are, if it's already covered in the first paragraph and or there might be changes potentially between, can we just take that out? Is there a problem? Where, where are you suggesting taking out? To further resolve that the organization lists in attachments yeah. A okay, and B. Yeah, yeah. That's, yes. And then just leave it with organizations relinquishing will not receive additional. Yeah. Because I do think we should be explicit yes, about that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's right. That's so I'll take that out? Yes. Yeah. It helps the up the issue a little bit. I, I, I still think this, it 
change to the resolution makes sense. The um, but I'd say like if it's a million dollars and there's I want to say there's a little over 80 HP3 grantees. So I mean, there's 98 grants, but like maybe 80 or so programs. And if you take out the ones that are that would be relinquishing money. Let's see if you just go down to 50 programs, opt in to get more. That's twenty thousand dollars per program. It would actually the amount would be um, is that right? Uh, well, I think here it comes out. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars per program. One million divided by fifty. Well, on average, we, we, the, the the actual allocation would be, I think, probably the statutory formula. So some would get a thousand, some would get way more than twenty thousand. But it may be over a course of a year. It's not so much extra. They can't spend it. But I think we would know really soon. Like we would. It'll depend on the number yeah. that opt in, and which is why we have yeah. that. So amount larger, less opt in. So that's why they have to affirm. We have to pack it like opt in. Um, that we should say there. All right. Let's go ahead and. Uh... I'll make the motion. All right, we have a motion on the resolution, Vanetta. The last sentence is incomplete under the first result. Oh, no, you're right, it's going forward, step back. Okay, um, all right, we have a motion. Who's second? Patience. 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 Okay. Um, Ablogi? Yes. Paul? Yes. Rightmaster? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Kalkin? Iskin? Yes. King? Yes, and abstained as to slow laugh. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milron? Yes. Morales? Yes. Vargas? Alsarov? Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yeah. Motion All right, we're going to take a just a short bio break and then um, reconvene in a few minutes. We'll call it two oh five. How's that? Um, so we'll see everybody shortly. Thanks. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back. Let's get a rolling back. I like this. Thank you, LA. All right, five. Everybody back? We good? LA? Thumbs up? No, no uh, video yet in LA. Do <laughs> LA, you online? Oh, good. I think they said they were trying to do a reboot. Uh huh. Okay, let's give them another minute. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, we were on mute. Um, we are rebooting our system here, um, in case that helps with the speaker volume issue. If, if we can one more minute, I think it's coming back up now. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Does that work? Can you hear us? I'm excited, excited nonetheless. Oh, yeah. I think it works. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, LA. We can turn that. I think we can turn that. Cleveland. All right. Quad uh, one. We're back on the agenda. Is there a hand in the public? Okay. Let me hand it off to the Troika, Erica, Elizabeth, and Vaughn. Okay. Um, so while um, Eric is pulling up the PowerPoint, this is a reminder at um, the July 13th meeting, the commission approved development of guidelines for the use of um, loan repayment assistance programs. Um, and so we convened a working group made up of um, commissioners on the trust fund commission as well as members of the state bars uh, council on access and fairness so thank you chris patience and jeff and then judge kristen rosie and heather anderson from color um so we work to uh develop guidelines based on um the uh amended uh IOTA statute um and we also previewed enough guidelines with lack and with the access commission and we held a webinar with grant to gather additional feedback um before we um issued the um draft um uh, Guide, uh, guidelines that you have in your packet today. Um, so just a quick note, I want to clarify that we are not um, setting up a separate fund for LRAP. We will be running allocations as usual. However, grantees will have the option to budget um, their IELTA and or EAF funds towards loan repayment assistance programs um, uh, if they choose. Um, so uh, for today, we're going to walk through the statutory amendment and how we will implement it, uh, the proposed guidelines. Um, and um, uh, uh, our verification and data collection process as well. So I'll turn over to Erica first. Thanks. Um, before we get into the proposed guidelines themselves, just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about the relevant governing authorities that we looked at um, in drafting them. And those are Business and Professions Code Section 6218, 6219, 6223, and then the, the State Budget Act of 2023. Um, so starting with 6223, um, this provision highlights the restrictions on the use of IELTA and EAF funds. Um, so no fee generating work unless it meets an exception. Um, no criminal legal services, again, unless it meets an exception. Um, and then legal assistance should only be provided to indigent persons um, uh, in the case of qualified legal services projects or uh, support services if the organization is a support center. Um, and so that's what staff is looking for usually when we're reviewing budgets um, in terms of the use of IELTA and EAF funds. Um, if, if the work that's being performed meets these requirements, it's generally referred to as qualifying work for the purposes of IELTA and EAF. Um, and any employees that are provided loan repayment assistance um, previously through organizations that have existing LRAP programs, they have to be doing this type of qualifying work um, in order to budget for it in prior years. Um, and then uh, 6218, um, again, is in line with 6223. It outlines the obligations on the use of IELTA funds, um, as well as EAF, which is administered on the same basis. Um, and in both instances, for both QLSPs at the support centers, it reiterates the need to fund qualifying work. Um, there are a couple exceptions, which is what's highlighted on the slide, you know, or for such other purposes as set forth in the article or as permitted by section 6219. Um, so section 6219 um, until the end of June previously just had subsection A, um, which allowed for organizations to provide paying work opportunities to uh, or scholarships to disadvantaged law students to help defray their law school expenses. So um, this has been seen as the only exception to funding qualifying work um, that organizations could use the funds in this way instead um, or in addition to their qualifying work. Um, at the end of June, 6219B was added, which allows for a loan repayment assistance program administered by the California Access to Justice Commission, um, which also ostensibly would not require those funds to be used for, for qualifying work, um, given its placement um, in this section of the statute. Um, so in, in some ways, this provision is making um, loan repayment assistance more expensive because it is exempting uh, attorneys funded with through the program from doing qualifying work, um, but it's also more restrictive in that um, it's 
required to be used on staff attorneys, whereas uh, loan repayment assistance programs under uh, IL 10 EAF previously were not restricted to any particular um, job title or classification. So, um, it, you know, we believe that this new program is in addition to um, the prior uh, guidance that has been given regarding loan repayment assistance. Um, and so it's essentially two options in terms of uh, budgeting, which we will get into. Um, and then just the, the last piece is the State Budget Act. This is really just highlighting the fact that um, it, it's making clear that any requirements around the use of IELTA funds are equally applicable to equal access funds. Um, including this new provision under 6219. Um, so I think Elizabeth is going to now um, start talking about the proposed guidelines themselves. Uh, Chris, do you have a question? Um, I raised my hand. Uh, There's I a did. question. Yeah. Oh, Hi, this, this is Eric. We have kind of a cumbersome process for raising our hand here. So sorry about <laughs> that. So I raised it for somebody. I don't know who it was. Anyway, so I might I, this may be jumping the gun a little bit, and, and if you're going to get to this later, just, just tell me. But I'm just wondering, is there any limit uh, to the amount of the an organization's IOLTA grant that could be can be allocated to the LRAP program, or limits to how organizations distribute LRAP benefits amongst their employees? or limits to how much a particular employee could get? I'm just curious about that. Or is it just up to the organization to decide all these things? I'm skipping here, but we'll answer your question, Eric. It, it is going to be up to the organization because how we've viewed LRAP before and um, is that LRAP is like salaries and benefits, and we don't dictate that for organizations. However, with that said, though, because this is the first time we've issued guidance on this, what we will do is next year we'll report out um, kind of the amounts that's being funneled through LRAP, whether it's a self-administered LRAP, whether it's going to a third party, you'll have all that information at your fingertips if you choose to then put caps on it. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to be necessary, but the thing is, it, it, we, we don't know the amount of, um, we don't know the amount, we, we have estimates of what we think the, the student debt load is um, based on a survey that Erica did a few years ago, based on how many FTEs are at organizations, but we won't really know until this like launches. So our I, our thought was these are guidelines, right? One year programs have been told this is for this year. We're going to gather more data. I'll bring it back to you all. Um, and at that point, you might want to put some caps on it. You might want to take this through codification. So there's a standing rule. Um, but we 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 didn't want to treat it differently at this juncture. We, I'm just I'll ask one more question and then and then stop. But do we have any sense going in for like what? how much like a typical attorney for an organization that chooses to participate in the program, how much benefit like an attorney might get? Talk about $15,000. No, probably not. I mean, but the thing is there's only a handful of programs and patients might be able to speak to this. There's only a handful of programs right now that have um, self-administered LRAP. So that that's, that's our understanding of it. They're in the realm of um, and patients, Elizabeth uh, chime in about five, $600 a month. We're talking yeah, in the yeah. realm of $6,000 a year. For if it's a self-administered, right? We're still waiting on the program requirements for the Access Commission's LRAP um, program. Our understanding that's based on income-based um, repayment. So again, income-based is going to be really variable from one from one attorney to another. But if you're thinking about like income-based as a, Erica knows more about this, about 10% of a, a salary of 80,000, you're looking at right there, 8,000 at kind of the high end. So, but again, this is all really variable. That's hard. I mean, we've been asked this question so many times. What's the estimate? We, we don't know for you. We have these variables, but it's, we, we can't say for certainty, right, Erica and yeah. Elizabeth? So, I don't, yes, substantively, that's pretty close to what we did at CCLS. Um, we were also, it was in our union contract that there would be an LRAP. Mm -hmm. um, and we, managed to extract from uh, the bargaining process the amount so I could raise it um, while I was the ED without having to mess with the union. Um, but I, it, for us, it was a very, it was a very important recruitment and retention tool and it was not income based, which really, I mean, there's a whole lot of problems with that. Um, Anyway, it was it was very valuable and really important, and 
and it is one of the ways that this commission can give uh, programs leeway to do things that besides just raise the salary um, that will be materially important to the to the staff that are trying to recruit and keep. And to add Thank one, you. We've been talking about LRAP for ever. Like <laughs> we've been talking about LRAP for so long and the need for it. But it's especially critical now because um, lawyers will have to start paying back on their student loans in October. And they've had this, you know, grace period during the COVID pandemic. And I think it's going to be a stronger recruitment tool um, than, than ever because a lot of these folks have never had to pay a student loan payment. Mm -hmm. So just uh, one, one, one other safeguard that the commission has is say budgets come through and they're like, the number is wildly more than we could have ever thought. Your one safeguard is you don't approve um, budget awards, al allocate, you approve allocations now, but you don't approve the actual award until November. At that point, obviously, then the staff will trigger it for you. We have a recommendation. We don't think it's going to come to that the first year, but but that that's your fallback, right? You have these guidelines, but it's a request, right? It's a budget request. You don't formally approve until November. Thank you. <clears throat> So I'll, I'll go ahead and walk through the guidelines. Um, so as, as many of you know, and as we have just talked about, um, several of our grantees already have um, their own self-administered LRAPs and already use IELTS and AF funds towards that. Um, and so the working group really wanted to continue this um, flexibility when developing the guidelines. Um, and so what we tried to do is um, kind of document what has already been kind of office practice related to LRAP. Um, and then uh, take the opportunity with 6219, looking at 6219B um, to uh, determine, you know, how to use these funds moving forward. So as you can see on the screen, um, there are some requirements, um, uh, including that the um, uh, beneficiary be an employee of the organization. So not a temp or a contractor, but a staff that might be a legal fellow or um, staff hired under a time limited grant would, would, uh, would likely qualify. Um, that this employee would need to be full or part time, and that the, um, the repayment would only be for educational loans, um, and um, that the staff would need to be working on qualifying work. Um, we also added that if the employee doesn't satisfy the terms of the LRAP and those funds need to be returned, uh, that the funds be returned to the grantee and used for other qualifying purposes um, or otherwise returned to the state bar if, if the um, grant terms require that. Um, additionally, um, the funds can be used um, for any grantee staff, um, so attorneys, non-attorneys, law grads that are not yet licensed, um, and for any ed type of educational loan, law school, um, other graduate school, undergrad. Um, and um, we wouldn't, uh, as uh, Eric's question kind of alluded to, we wouldn't limit um, payment options. It could be a fixed amount as determined by the employer um, or uh, uh, whatever uh, various plan income driven or standard. Um, and then, so this, this is our interpretation of 6219B, um, which uh, would only allow staff attorneys of the organization um, to, to benefit from, from the LRAP. And so we are, and we are defining um, attorney as licensed in the state of California or a registered legal aid attorney admitted under multi-jurisdictional practice. Um, and uh, the, they must receive LRAP assistance through the Access Commissions Program. Those two requirements are met um, then the work that they're doing would not need to be qualifying. Um, so we also wanted to build in some verification because potentially this could be um, quite um, a large amount of money uh, going towards um, LRAP. Um, and so um, uh, we're asking grantees um, have a verification letter from their third party administrator um, documenting that the funds indeed were used for LRAP, that the loans were educational, and that the employee has had maintained in, uh, sufficient employment status. Uh, we're also requiring that the grantee and the third party administrator have a contract or MOU, um, and that the uh, third party administrator be subject to audit. Uh, a new requirement for uh, grantees uh, who have their own self administered LRAP would be that they would need to self certify to this uh, to these requirements. Um, we will be working with the Access Commission and LAC to um, develop an evaluation um, so, so that we can collect some data uh, 
together um, and ensure that we're not, you know, double asking uh, grantee organizations for this information. We'll likely um, ask for additional information related to debt load, number of years, practicing, uh, whether the, uh, receiving the LRAP uh, influenced uh, their ability to stay in legal aid, um, and um, hope to be able to kind of iron all this out shortly. Um, I, before we move on to this, um, I did want to note uh, that, um, you know, the, the reading of 6219B uh, is uh, restrictive, and we have talked uh, to the legislature. So um, the working group, along with the Access Commission, as well as LAC, we did meet with ledge staff to try to get some clarification, um, and we have, um, the state bar has advanced a request for, for an amendment to, to um, have it be a little bit more flexible. Well, flexible and restricted. Um, just right. Like that, yes. The flexibility would be um, the reading of um, the staff attorney, um, whether that could be more uh, flexible. Um, the more restrictive is that it would need to be for qualifying work, and it would not um, allow for, for attorneys working on um, non-qualifying matters. Um, so we do have these charts here. If it's useful for, for you to un uh, better understand how uh, LRAP funds can be, um, ILTEF funds can be used for LRAP in the column in the middle, uh, that is for a self-administered or uh, other third-party LRAP, and then the column on the right is um, LRAP under 6219B, which would be the Access Commission's program. Is this open for questions? Yes. Or I know we're talking about this with IELTS and EAF. Is there any anticipation that like other grants could also be used for LRAP? Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, if an organization wanted to use um, other grants for towards LRAP, they it would need to be kind of within the terms of that grant. So, for example, HP, if their HP attorney, uh, uh, they were funding the LRAP for their HP attorney, that that would likely be um, appropriate. I think the committee would have to look at it. Got it, and it would go through the self-administered third party. Yeah. It is only it's subject to all of that stuff, but the, the one difference is the committee would determine whether they need to go through this analysis, right? So if it's LRAP, it needs, we think it needs to go to somebody that's been budgeted in that proposal that is working on that respective grant. Meaning at the very least. Right. Yeah. So in other words, just to make sure I'm understanding, 6219 is only IOLTA and the AF funds. Well, no, 6219 is the access commission's program where right. you can use it yes where yeah but they yes. you meaning if let's say an entity wanted to take hp funds and use the access commission as a third party to fund their lrap to use the access commission as an lrap program using their hp funds they go through the self-administered or third party bucket not 6219 is that correct Yes. Yes. They're going through the Access Commission. They're going through 62. So even if it's not IELTA funds, the Access Commission has told us it doesn't matter their source of funding. For our purposes, yeah, it would go through 6219. So then, if that's the case, anytime anything goes to the Access Commission, it doesn't have to be qualifying, regardless of the source of the funds. It doesn't have to be for IELTA. For what I'm saying, for the for grant specific, the committee and the commission will. It needs to tie back to that that grant proposal, right? So, so, so the, the program is going to be responsible to the grant. So let's say they have a, a, a big foundation of your grant. You decide to use some of it for LRAP. You can remit to the, as I understand it, to the Access Commission, and they will send it to the student, whatever. And that's sort of between the program and the grantor, whoever the, grant, the foundation in this case. So really, the only remit here is like, well, what happens to IELTS and EAF? And so, but my understanding is the, the, a, the a to J commission could, it doesn't matter where the money comes from. But they're the, they're the think, conduit for tax free. Okay, you're about to put. No, no, no. I, just, I think we're not really answering Erica's question. It's just my, my point is, I, I, in reading the memo, I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Is that 6219's exception to the qualifying like nature of the expenditures is is in terms of IELTA funds. And but it, and yeah, 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 through the budget. Right. Yes. Right. But HP is not is not going through 6219, right? So there's you still need to show well, that it qualifies. 
Well, for HP. For HP. I know we have some grants that, yeah. that don't have to meet income. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So sure, it's yes. just, it, it has to meet whatever this. For well, whatever. Know, if if right. HP says, oh, it adopts, you know. That's why we say for the respective committee, because they're all a little yeah. bit different. Like bank grant, technically, it doesn't have well, an like income requirement. So I guess, what I'm, I mean, yeah. I guess what I'm asking is like the, so for like staff attorneys, if they go through the access commissions, like LRAP program, but use HP funds, is it limited to staff attorneys? No. No. Okay. So in essence, Unless they're using my alter EAF funds, the access commission, anything becomes essentially a third party LRAP if the source is anything but my yes, alter EAF. But I'm going to be honest with you. This was a lot of work to do. We didn't contemplate all the scenarios of. of um, okay, that's fine. Right. I, I don't mean to. So that's why we cut our funding <laughs> to that committee to figure out like the nuances. But yes, generally, that's that's how it would work. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just no, trying no, to no, get yes, a sense yes, of like, yeah. whether the sources of funds. Yes. Like, uh, if everything, if the, the access, sorry. Go ahead. Let me see if I can answer it in coming from the backside. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is the purpose of the guidelines is to establish a standard for an external loan repayment program. Right. And Cal ATJ is going to end up being that in some instances. Right. But these guidelines will establish what the commission wants to happen for anybody using. IOLTA and EAF funds for that purpose. I think we can rely on the guidelines to guide us if those funds are used, if other funds besides IOLTA and EAF, because that's going to be sort of how the commission approaches what um, we're looking at. But we don't have the same statutory sort of rule or limitations, let's say for HP funds. Because those arose out of a different statute than I own to the EF. So I guess like so we use a framework. Them, like I the guidelines that are only for IELTS and EF funds, they don't apply to any of the other grants. No, except there is a line in the, the guidelines that say that um, you know it would be allowable with respective, you know, for those certain committees. Okay. But but that's like the general framework. I, I'm assuming those that committee would adopt in terms of the verification. The but if we're getting to like the nitty gritty of what's I, qualifying, I, I think that needs to be done at a committee level. I I'm sorry, sure. I just misunderstood yeah. the scope of the guidelines. And oh, for yeah, that, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 I no, thought the guidelines were for any grant that we handled no. going to any with being used in an LRAP. But if these are just guidelines for IELTS and EAF, ergo, this is how it's going to get split. Okay, that's fine. Got it. And then each committee would develop its own guidelines for its particular grant. Okay, sorry, I apologize. I feel like there's gonna be like a sniff test with the budgets where where each committee member will say will will know if something seems a little off if the line for LRAPs is so much larger than others. And so every every committee will say like this doesn't make sense. Um, but I did have one question about the um, the budgeting requirements. If the LRAP is administered by a third party, it it wouldn't count as personnel. But I was curious if y'all anticipate that committees would be slightly more lenient with that for the 75-25 split for personnel versus non-personnel. If the only reason they went over 25% was for an LRAP for their for their attorneys. We discussed that not not triggering right the the the, the ratio. Yeah, I mean I think the okay. amount would still be personal. It would still be personal. Yeah, it's, it's just the administrative. Now. Like the fees paid to the administrator or not? Yeah. Been, we're, uh, yes, no, we're not trying to we're not trying to trick, not trying to trick more yeah. because the way we have viewed LRAP is salaries. But we're we're not trying to trigger like additional like commission. Yeah. 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 That totally makes sense. Yes, to be flexible. Yeah. Got it. I, I'm asking for new organizations who will have no background on the 7525 yeah. and be worried about what they do triggering yes. additional yes. review. I mean, this is going to be an area that we're going to have to um, give technical assistance. We're hope LAC was probably going to have to too, because we've already fielded a lot of very like down to the detailed kind of questions about specific. So um, there are a lot of questions coming out. So just be prepared. So we know. Okay. Right, and and I think some of our questions can't be answered because we will, we're relying on the Access Commission to develop their program. Yeah. By the way, I'm sorry. My questions were not intended to be like. Challenging. Oh, you no, guys no, have no, done like no, a no, ton no, of work in a very yeah. short yeah. amount of time. All I was, yeah, yeah. I just didn't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a misunderstanding on my part. So no, no, I apologize. No, 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 no. All questions are there. Um, is there one more slide? 
Well, we have uh, we have another visual if that's useful for people to understand, but it sounds like maybe not. Yeah, this may be not necessary. Um, so we can go to the discussion or discussion. Or discussion. Yeah, so just please read the resolution that's on the screen and then just to be big picture. We met in uh, June, took a vote on whether to develop guidelines, met in July, took a vote on whether to develop guidelines, voted to develop guidelines. These are the guidelines. They're basically a year. I don't want to call them a placeholder, but they're intended to help guide programs who are going to be accessing the LRAP program that's in 6219B. This is going to be an issue that arises again um, for a variety of different reasons, but I, I'd say you know the, the guidelines are probably going to change in some some respect. Um, part of the part of the the way in which they might change is that 6219B includes language that I think there is consensus in the community needs to be clarified. And so the question is whether that will happen and, and if so, when. But our purposes today are really to approve the guidelines that have been developed. And that's sort of the task at hand. So with that in mind, let me see if anybody has comments. Uh, and then I just note uh, Jim and Catherine are both commissioners on the Access to Justice Commission, so they are recused from um, participating in the discussion and decision. Um, so they are not endorsing anything that's being said or not said. And I just want to note on the, the motion, um, the first motion is in your memo. The second motion is added. Um, very recently, just because of those conversations that we've been having with um, leg um, leg staff, and they bet that something gets changed, um, that the staff will have uh, authority with the chair um, to to make those changes to the guidelines. Like that. One comment I'll make, um, which is just my general view, is like I don't know where where we plan to like put this or. Um, for the, the organizations, but I, I will, re I think I've said this before, but I think it would be great if we had like a library or something mm -hmm. on like the trust fund well, we, we, website. On um, their smart, simple website, there's a resources, oh, that's perfect. Where, and there's a governing authorities. This is where we will drop that as a placeholder because it's not a safe bar rule yet. Yeah. If this becomes, if you wanted to make this into a rule or something more permanent, then yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be go into, it'll, it'll, it'll migrate. Yeah. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure it was like easily accessible. Yeah. That sounds like a great place for it to be. Uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, first of all, I want to thank our staff that was put in a very difficult position on this matter. And also, I want to thank the fellow members of the committee that worked with us through. There were a lot of moving parts. You know, I'm really, I, I'm not completely comfortable here with how this is, it feels like it's being rushed and pulled together in an inappropriate way. I'm sensitive to the needs of the recipients to start having some guidelines that they can work from so that we can begin to use this money towards this effort. Um, it, it's still, I don't feel it has the clarity that it needs, but at least it's a good start given the position that we were put in. So thank you everybody for your help. Okay, um, seeing no further hands, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. Roll call. Um, Ablagi? Yes. Paul? Yes. Fightmaster? Yes. Blakemore? Thank you. Michelle? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Iskin? Yes. 
King? Yes. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? On advice of State Bar Council, I abstain. Milroy? Yes. Morales? Vargas? Al Saraf? Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yeah. Motion passes. Thank you to the, the working group committee and the staff. You guys did that in like less than a month. That was amazing. And these are very great, very good guidelines. Thank you all for, for working on the guidelines. This is going to be very helpful. Yes, some TVCs. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you for um, the thank you. Um, 5.2 public comment first. Okay. Um, Erica. Yes, sorry, I just opened up with a different PowerPoint. Let me see. Sorry, right, give us a minute. We're having tech issues. Did you have that? Yes, I did. Um, hopefully, you can all see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, 5.2 is uh, recommendations regarding the ILTA reserve policy. Um, so this was a, a topic that was addressed by the Rules Committee back in, in June, and I think to some extent it was touched on and discussed a little bit during the Commission's June meeting when we talked about the, the ILTA distribution and creation of a reserve. Um, the working group on this topic was um, Catherine Blakemore and Selena with uh, support from uh, Tammy Honey and Jeff Ball. Um, so just a little background on the creation of an IELTA reserve policy. There currently is uh, nothing codified in relation to that. Um, Business and Professions Code um, allows for the, the creation of a, a fiscally responsible reserve. Um, and uh, we also looked at the distribution, the requirement that funds continue to be distributed on an annual basis. Um, so, um, Historically, even though there is no nothing codified to date, um, there was a memorandum back in 2006 uh, regarding revenue projections um, and distribution determinations by the commission, uh, which has been used as guidance in the absence of any other um, and any other rules or statutes um, related to it. So, um, up to this point, the guidance has been when there's decreasing revenue to hold back. Um, you know, anywhere between 30 and 75% of cash on hand, which is the amounts that are coming in throughout the year um, of a prior year's revenue. Um, and then there used to be this four-step calculation that's that's outlined for years um, of increasing revenue, um, where some amount would be set aside for reserve and some amount would be set aside for, for distribution. Um, but the challenge with that calculation is that there, there was no actual reserve. It was really just setting money aside that kind of continued to be cash on hand. Um, and so one of the priorities of this working group was um, to actually establish a real reserve that would be restricted um, to particular uses. Um, another thing that was discussed at the rules committee level with the working group was addressing large fluctuations in grant distributions. So um, this is just to demonstrate that over the past 10 years, sort of the changes in IELTA amounts um, that have gone out and how much it has gone up and down um, in that time, and um, why it's been a challenge for grantees at times to, to adjust um, when they received 55 million in 2020 and then 24 million in 2021. Um, that given that this is core funding for these organizations, it can be challenging to, to see such large fluctuations in the amounts that they're receiving in terms of long-term planning and budgeting. Um, 
So some other things that impact uh, the amount available for distribution or the federal funds rate, um, which I'm sure we've all discussed at length, uh, continues to increase, um, but that hasn't always been the case. And so um, the federal funds rate impacts um, the interest rates that banks have on, on their IOLTA accounts. And so um, has a pretty strong influence on how much revenue is generated on a yearly basis for IOLTA. Um, the amounts on deposit in the IELTA accounts are also a major contributing factor to um, how much is generated in terms of revenue. Uh, the, the State Parks Leadership Bank program also encourages banks to participate, um, which increases their revenue by, um, by participating and setting a specific amount um, in terms of the interest rates that they, they charge. Um, and then there are other sources of funding that contribute to IELTA, which is not purely from the IELTA accounts. Um, those are from attorney fee statements, the Justice Gap Fund, which is donations, um, and any other contributions that come in for those purposes. Um, and then something else that can contribute to the amount available for distribution is investments. So um, we had highlighted in the memo that there's, um, you know, some amounts um, that the state bar um, is holding on to at any given point might be invested in short-term accounts and the interest generated from uh, the sort of bonds and other interest bearing accounts uh, are goes back into distribution. So it's another way of, um, you know, making sure that money is not sitting idle and that it's contributing to overall funding. Um, and then there was also a discussion about the role of equal access fund, which is administered on the same basis as IOLTA. Um, there really is no control over, you know, in terms of the commission, in terms of how much is going to be distributed with equal access fund on a, um, in a given year, um, even though um, the amount is known. And so uh, just keeping that in mind in terms of when there's major fluctuations with say a grant like EAF, that that could also impact grantees um, and being mindful in terms of determining IELTA distribution in relation to that. Um, so some of the things the committee discussed um, based on the working group's feedback were separating the concepts of catch on hand and reserve um, so, like I said, the money that comes in as revenue during the year is considered cash on hand to be used for grant distributions and administrative expenses. Um, in the past, that's often been called a reserve, but it's not truly a reserve. It's just money that can be used um, to maintain cash flow. And so creating an actual reserve that's set aside for the purpose of ensuring that funds are available, let's say, if a uh, grant uh, distribution is expected to drop significantly, to help kind of smooth out some of those fluctuations and um, in, in funding. Um, making sure that, you know, reserve and distribution decisions don't necessarily have to be um, done hand in hand. Uh, reducing the time frame for revenue projection. So under the old formula, it required not only knowing how much revenue is expected for the remainder of this year, but also the, um, the following year. Uh, this new um, proposal is going to cut it down to just projecting through the end of the current year, um, which would make it much more reliable um, for staff, for grantees, and for the commission in terms of having confidence in the amounts that you're setting for distribution, um, that, that that money will be available um, and, and that there won't be a shortfall. Um, also, creating clear guidance for increasing and decreasing revenue environments, um, but making sure that the commission still has discretion uh, to be responsive to late like communities' needs when necessary, um, given changes in, in revenue. Um, and then again, uh, one of the big things was addressing large fluctuations in grant distribution when and where possible. Um, so the, the main proposals were to um, use as a distribution starting point at the end of year fund balance, meaning how much cash is expected to be on hand at the end of the year that total amount would then become the distribution for the following year. Um, if revenue is increasing, some of that amount could be set aside for a reserve. If it's decreasing, um, you could take from the reserve and supplement the distribution. Um, as I mentioned, it wouldn't require projection beyond the end of the current year, so we can have more confidence in the amounts that are actually going to be available. Um, the idea to create that restrictive reserve was, was for two main reasons, to provide grant stabilization to the grant grantees um, so that the um, you could make a decision about when and 
where to supplement grants as needed. Um, and then also in emergency circumstances. So um, if some sort of catastrophic event were to happen and more funding was needed, um, if there was a shortfall in revenue and we could cover grant payments for some reason, um, the reserve could be used to uh, make sure that those payments went out um, as planned. Um, also a recommendation to make that reserve the maximum balance 25 million uh, with the provision to increase with inflation at the commission's discretion that can be revisited periodically. Um, and also under circumstances where uh, the distribution might more than double, you can also increase about 25 million um, as you see appropriate up to a maximum of 40 million. Um, and then also, uh, it's not in the rule. I'm sorry, it is in the rule, uh, but not a specific amount. Uh, the possibility of multi year budgeting. So, encouraging uh, the exploration of multi year budgeting when there are large distributions to um, allow grantees the flexibility to spend down funds um, and not have to have it spent all in one year, even though funds will continue to be distributed on an annual basis um, to conform to the requirements under the statute. Um, and then, so, so those recommendations would become part of a new rule. Um, as I mentioned, there is no existing rule. Uh, some other aspects of the new rule are to set a 5% target for increasing the reserve in years of increasing revenue, have that 25 million. Um, as I mentioned before, factors for accessing the reserve would be either in emergencies or when there's a large drop in revenue, revenue say more than 15%. Um, a requirement to use the reserve to fulfill existing obligations if that were necessary. Um, and then that multi-year budgeting option, which is something that I think was discussed um, sort of at length at the last commission meeting. Um, and so that is something that's also uh, part of the proposed rule. But um, happy to take questions about um, the proposal or the rule itself before getting into the motion. Yeah, go ahead, um, LA. Anybody? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I think it makes sense, and I'm inclined to vote for it as framed. But I just wondered, instead of setting kind of a hard dollar amount of 25 million as the maximum distribution, which number might seem that it makes sense today, it may seem nonsensical a couple of years from now, given the fluctuations in IELTA amounts that are available. Did you consider maybe just coming up with a formula, like a percentage of cash on hand? When I say cash on hand, I mean, you know, using your formula, the beginning of the year cash balance plus net cash that comes in during the year. Um, IELTA money is less the distribution, less admin, like a percentage of that, as opposed to baking in a $25 million number. <clears throat> I have, I have these same type of question. Yeah. Yeah. As one of the committee members, and Catherine can add to this, um, there is in the proposal it does allow um, a, a possibility of increasing over time. We were a little hesitant to be too tied into the numbers because there's the whole ecosystem of funding that's out there. And you know, 14 years ago when we did not have a healthy reserve like this or healthy uh, budget we could look at, you know, as LSC funding was was um, uh, you know, at risk and private funders cut back and, and there were all these things at place. Um, this commission actually pushed out more money than you might have in other times because you wanted to make sure that organizations could literally keep their doors open. Um, and so I think, you know, as, a, a, you know, giving your future commission members a little bit of flexibility so that you can take into consideration, is LSC getting cut? You know, is there a huge increase or a huge decrease in equal access fund? Um, are there things happening in the private foundation community that you are aware of where you might want to push more or less money out for that reason? Um, so I think 25 was what we thought felt very prudent and conservative and careful, but future commission members could say, actually, we think it should be 30, given all the circumstances. Well, but maybe, I, um, well, go ahead, Efrain. Yeah, th thanks, Chris, and thanks for raising that, Eric, I, because now I'm questioning how I read the actual proposed rule. I, I thought the rule is authorizing just a minimum of 5% annually of whatever the current year revenue is and not that we're depositing 25 million every year. That it's, that it's, a, it's a floor of 5% that 
that a minimum that you have to put in the reserve based on what you have available, but that you can't grow the reserve to more than 25 once you hit that. Am I understanding that? Or are we saying just grab 25 off the top every year and put it in some bank accounts? No, no, you're, how you described it is correct. Um, okay. It's, it's, it's zero out of four. Yeah. And, and, and so I guess, but what Eric raised for me is since you have a minimum, and part of our charge is to also make sure to get enough money out, should we set a maximum so that a commission can't go crazy and over put money and say, let's just max out to the 25 million this year because we don't want to do grants or anything. Because I see a minimum and I see the extent that it could grow, but some commission could say, let's do 15% this year of the money we have into the reserve. And I'm just wondering if, if that's okay or if that's the dynamic that we would welcome. I guess I don't have that worry, but I I misunderstood the memo versus the presentation. So I'm glad for the clarification because I I thought that the floor was formulaic, and then then I think I got got it twisted, thinking that you were setting 25 as the minimum floor, and yeah. and, and I I'm up, was upside down. So okay. I'm clear. Thank it's you. a maximum the, allowable reserve balance. Yeah. yeah. The floor is when years of revenue right. are increasing plus so five percent. Yeah. Um, but if you've already hit twenty five million, then that floor doesn't exist because you've already reached yeah. the maximum allowable balance. Um, you know, notwithstanding the part about inflation um, or years where revenue is going to more than double, then you could increase above twenty five million, but. Um, we we landed on that 25 million number as an average of the past 10 years distributions. That's how it sort of seemed like the prudent amount to start with. Um, it's not to say that the commission can never revisit this or potentially revise the rule, but given that this has never been codified before and this is our starting point, um, that seemed, um, and also for all the reasons that Selena mentioned, the, sort of the, the reasonable place to start to, to continue emphasizing um, distribution and not building back so much funding, but making sure that there is a little bit um, of a cushion there. Well, the language I find particularly helpful in attachment B is B to A and B. So if you look at the memo, I think that language is really clear in the proposed new rule. Uh I guess I kind of want to shout out past commissions for and staff for operating without a rule. It's kind of a <laughs> that's kind of amazing um, that we're doing this for the first time. So thank you. I, this is really there's a lot of things to think about here. So uh, I really appreciate that we've sort of put this into a document. Uh, I think it's going to be very useful going forward. All right, well, I don't see anybody else with questions, so let's take up the rest. Can, can I ask just one just yeah. practical question? Um, so if this passes, we're going to take 25 million off the top now. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We're just going to put in 5% until we reach the 25 million. Well, well you, you've already decided the 20, 24 distribution. Yeah. I'm just going to let clarify last. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 that's helpful. That's, that's been done. Board of Trustees has approved that. Yes. Getting ready. So this, this will be like moving forward. This and then it needs to go through formal rule, you know, comments and stuff like that. So I actually don't know if it's going to be in time for um to take an impact uh, by the next commission meeting. But the thing is, um, I think I mentioned last time we don't really have right now um a standing policy that's like takes effect. So you could even if this isn't officially get codified, glean the principles from this for next year, like we did in June. But I know that answers your question. But it, it's not for 20, 2024 is done. We, we've already decided. I guess what I'm asking is, where are we going to build up to the 25 million we, over however many years? We already decided years? to stop away 25 million. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. So we already have 25 have million. million. That's what I was trying to remember. So going forward, if revenue keeps increasing, we're really not going to add anything unless it more than doubles, at which point we become like an escape patch yeah. to smooth it out. Okay. God willing, and the creek don't rise. Yeah. Yes. Fingers crossed, yeah. right? Hope we're not rushing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe saying that is the worst. Um, okay, Jeff. 
No, I just, in response to that, I just want to point out, and I think you had made the comment earlier, Mr. Chairman, that you know, future commissions will always have the ability to go back and look at this. So if we have extraordinary situation that was not anticipated as part of this uh, equation, that they would have the opportunity to revisit it at that point. But this at least gives staff some guidance um, and, and establishes a baseline as we're thinking in the work mm -hmm. that we try to do to level out the distributions. Yeah. Is that a, a motion, Jeff? I, 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 I'll make that a motion, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and Tammy just seconded if you couldn't hear her. <laughs> no, no, I'm just looking at the rule. Um, when we say, when we talk about um, there's the, the maximum reserve balance instead of 25 million, and we discussed that it can be periodically increased to account for inflation. And then also, if you know, the distribution is super high, um, more than double the amount. But on the inflation one, we say can be periodically, we can choose to increase. Uh, the maximum allowable balance to account for inflation as reflected by the overall percentage increase in the Bureau of Labor Statistics and Consumer Price Index in the prior 12 months. Why do we have in the prior 12 months there? Um, my concern is, as I read that, like let's say, say we don't increase next year, but like two years from now we want to, I would almost read that as saying, oh, if we want to increase it, then we can only increase it to account for the that year's inflation, oh, not oh, inflation oh. since we said it at 25 million. Yes. Does that, you see what I'm saying? So, uh, why I mean, can't we just, why can't we just say to account for inflation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah, I did. Let me ask the bankers, Do you, did you hear uh, Brady's comment? Thank you. Um, I, I was getting, it was kind of fading in and out for me. So sure. the question is on how we define inflation. No, well, so not even that. If you look at uh, the proposed rule B2A, and it's saying the commission may periodically choose to increase the maximum allowable reserve balance to account for inflation as reflected by the overall percentage increase in the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index in the prior 12 months. And my, what I just noticed um, is that, so the, so the commission periodically may choose to increase it to re reflect inflation. So one would think if, if they didn't do it next year, the next couple of years, but five years from now, they decide, oh, let's increase the maximum to re reflect inflation. I'd assume that should be inflation since it was set at 25 million. But I would read that in the prior 12 months to say, oh, five years from now, when I increase, when I increase the maximum to uh, reflect inflation, I'm only allowed to look at the inflation in the past 12 months, which I don't think is. Meaning if in year one it jumped, if inflation yeah. jumped 6% and then was flat in, in year five, you couldn't account for the first 6% right. increase, yes. right? Whereas you want, what you want is like, Either you say since the last time or nothing. or nothing. Nothing is better. Or just how about the consumer? So is right. I would strike in the prior twelve months. Yeah. So. so the the proposal is to strike prior twelve months. Yes. I'm happy to amend the motion to include that change. Sorry for no no. no, no. So good. Uh, Tammy, I'll give you an opportunity to second that. I'll second it. Thank All you. right. Thank I had a question. Go ahead. Uh, Selena was uh, mentioning that we could consider the funding environment generally when deciding whether to dip into the reserve. Uh, but we, in the rule, it, it mentions catastrophic events or other emergency circumstances. Is it consistent that we look at what other funders are doing? Is that a considered an emergency circumstance? Well, it does say legally that emergency circumstances that affect legally funding generally. So I think that's where it would sort of come in. So like if there are emergency circumstances where other, am I, am I correct in understanding that? Where there were like other entities were getting cut, yeah. that would be, that would be where we would consider that's the catch-all one. Yeah. Yes. It's not a question. Yeah, it's an option. And I think it's important to understand in my prior point that 
we're not intending to fully handcuff the commission going forward. These are guidelines. And as unusual circumstances present themselves, we have to have uh, trust that the, the commission will react to that appropriately. That certainly makes sense to me. That I'm wondering if striking emergency would be appropriate to allow that flexibility. So we are not bound to say, oh, this is an emergency and defining what that is. But a trust, fund, a trust fund commission could look at this whole thing and throw it out in a year. So again, it's not restricting them to just that scenario. It's providing guidance so that it identifies where there may be appropriate elements that suggest they take a different path. Yeah. But if you've got an extraordinary, if you've got a situation, let's say there's a change in funding mechanism, the whole thing can be revisited. So the rule won't restrict the commission? No, because C provides that the commission has essentially the authority to determine whether to access the funds. One, two, and three are merely guidance for like at this time when we are passing oh. the, with the factors we think may be relevant, but it's those are not um, exhaustive. Exhaustive. They're not. They're they're not the exclusive list of circumstances. Does that make sense? Right. right. Think, yes. Okay. So, can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Um, and you may have covered this. I apologize if I'm asking you to repeat yourself, but we it provides for a minimum of 5% of current year revenue. What is current year revenue? Oh, are you asking me literally what, what the current 2020? Yeah, what, 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 what does it mean? What does it mean? It means like, so if you were in 2023, you were doing the distribution for 2024 back in June. So whatever revenue comes in over the course of 2023 in terms of IELTA revenue from the interest that's coming off the IELTA accounts. So total, not, 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 not net of expenses, not net of admin or anything, just total revenue. Right. The, okay. Gross. It's, no, it's the fund balance of the fund, fund balance. balance. So. It's a fund balance. So it is net. Um, and so, and what happens practically is, you know, in June, we have the first quarter of actual, and then you project out for the rest of the year. And then we, we back out of our grant obligations and our admin. That's correct. And the formula that we were using before required staff to project not only the future period of the end of the year, but also the following year. So by doing it this way, it simplifies it for staff. And it's an assurance for programs too, right? It's the money they can. Make. Right. And if I can just chime in here uh, for some of those uh, questions that are concerned about future commissions and how they might allocate, you know, historically, um, and this is something that Selena was just uh, referring to, we have as a as a body been um, less risk adverse and more risk adverse or more more risky with the funds, depending on what the programs needed at the time. So we have um, in the past provided more funding um, than potentially would have been a, a conservative way to go. Um, and in this last uh, uh, budget review, it, you noticed that we were more conservative because there's, a, there's plenty of funds that are, are being distributed. So I think, um, the, the body itself, along with the staff, as, as well as what Jeff is referring to, the conditions um, at the time will dictate how the commission will react. And you know, our objective here is to protect the work of the programs. So with that in mind, there will be a decision made accordingly. Right. We yes. have uh, Jeff. One more thing, or no? I just have what? I think we have the revised motion on the screen. That is consistent 
with the motion that I proposed. Tammy, you're still good on your second. Yeah. Yep. So you do have a motion and a second, Mr. Chair. Yes. Did you have something, Ephraim? It, it actually, it doesn't have bearing on my vote. I can just ask staff later. I, I just was going to ask when we say a restricted fund, what kind of does it go into an interest bearing account? Where does the money sit? Because if it has a cap of 25, does it earn interest anywhere? Yeah, like it, we do. We um, Our uh, investment policy is in line with the state bar, but um, I think I mentioned at the last commission meeting, um, because our grant funding is so large in terms of state bar revenue, we, are, we, we will actually try to um, have an investment policy aligned with the state bars, but really specific to our grant funding. But to answer your question directly, um, yes, it go, does go into interest bearing account. It's doing really, really well, as you can imagine, because interest rates are good. Um, if Michael's on me, he might be able to give you the interest rate, but I think it's about uh, 5%, right, Michael? A little bit more than that when we last checked. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, closer to five and a half um, yeah. for the last um, maturity date that um, we had looked at. It, uh, I think, expires middle, middle third week of September. Um, it's for a 90 day period. And uh, we put in, I want to say $55 million. Um, to earn um, that level of interest in terms of the deposit. So um, as a part of the last June uh, commission meeting, um, the anticipated interest generated from just um, IOLTA revenue activity, um, you know, by way of looking at cash flow and working with our CFO on making uh, these um, investment decisions, um, it was close to two, $2.1 million of anticipated uh, interest revenue earned just on that alone. So we are uh, very cognizant of um, the uh, sort of potential amount that we could earn uh, that would go back in solely for the purpose of funding the programs. Right. It is, Mr. Chairman, if I could cl clarify that that investment policy is a, an investment policy that's focused on capital preservation and not income, meaning that it, it's a very conservative investment policy, recognizing that the first priority is not for the fund to lose money. And add that this may be like showing my ignorance of actual like accounting and how the accounts work, but like, will we scrape everything over the 25 million, the interest, and then just stick it into distributions? We need to scrape. Well, yeah. like, we have 25 million in an account and it earns a million bucks in interest. Now it's twenty six million. So does that does that one million just go into the distribution right. pot? It goes in the distribution pot. Then it gets presented to you in terms of what all your revenue streams are. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. He doesn't decide. He doesn't accumulate anything. We'll always we'll always take the interest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah we we'll reduce always, it down to twenty five. Right. In June, you always get our pretty much our balance sheet of yeah, yeah, everything. Okay. Like right, what the admin was actually actual. We had projected what. Our revenue was for the first quarter, all our deposits, interest, all that good stuff is in one. And then and then you decide the next Unless year. you want to periodically say, hey, we're going to increase this. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I just meant like if we didn't increase yeah. it, yeah. we would we yeah. would yeah. scrape whatever is excess to get bring it down to 25 yeah. every yes. year. Yes. That's all. Yeah. So yeah. the, the, the revenue and the interest has been really good. Um, yeah. Like Michael said, our CFO is very proactive and when it matures, she comes to Rocio, Michael, and myself and gives us products. We pick, it, it's all very nicely packaged, but the thing is we, we want to bring that visibility to you and you guys yeah. guide us to make sure this is how you want it to be managed, right? We think we're doing a good job, but we want to make sure you, you think that too. It's called roll. Okay. Um, Aglagi? Yes. Paul? Yes. Fight Master? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Rochelle? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Balkin? Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Speaker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Vargas? Alcaraz? Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that leads very quickly and 
beautifully into 5.3, which is our 2024 I will grant. Um, so just some recommendations um, regarding uh, budgeting and uh, reporting for IELTS grants in the coming current year. Um, as you all know, you recommended a, 90, a little over 95 million uh, distribution for IELTS next year, which was approved by the Board of Trustees. Um, so that's representing an 88% increase in uh, grants available over the current year. Um, at the time of your discussion back in June, there was uh, a two year spend down period proposed um, with encouragement to look into whether more than two years would be viable um, as an option um, to given the, the large increase in funds. So staff did some research um, since that last meeting and also uh, sent a survey out to grantees regarding their preferences regarding spend down if um, you know four years was uh, three or four years was something they were interested in and if they had the ability to to track their spending over that period of time, along with receiving additional distributions on top of that. Um, and so um, based on that, uh, there was discussion with eligibility and budget review committee this morning um, with a proposal for a four year spend down period um, for 2024 IELTA funds. Um, this would not apply to EIF, which will remain a one year spending period. Um, the distribution would still occur completely in 2024. And so that would give grantees the ability to spend as quickly or as slowly as they wanted within that period of time. If they have the ability to spend in one year, they're welcome to do that. If not, then they can uh, spread the funds out over time, but they would still be getting their yearly installments in 2025, 2026, and 2027 as well. Um, so that would just be something to be mindful of that um, they might still have remaining funding while getting additional distributions in subsequent years. Um, and then the other recommendation was to, to adjust from a quarterly expenditure reporting basis to a semi-annual basis, um, to uh, just given sort of the length of time um, and the ability to, to have grantees track on a quarterly basis, but not need to submit reports every quarter. Um, and um, yeah, I think Rocio has some more details regarding the, the survey that went out um, and um, sort of the discussion that we had at the level. Thank you, Erica. Um, so the grantee survey that we sent out, very appreciative of all of our grantees who responded. We had almost, um, I believe almost 70, I think it were 68 organizations that did respond um, to a number of questions such as, you know, would you be in support of the four year spend down? How likely would you be to actually um, take advantage of that spend down period? And so generally speaking, the vast majority, um, which we weren't surprised by, are in support, um, either strongly support or support the having additional flexibility of a four year period to spend or to opt in to have that flexibility up to a four year period to spend down the 2024 um, distribution. Um, but really, you know, we did ask for additional feedback and comments as well. Um, and it seems that about half, just under half of total um, respondents did say that they are likely, um, they would be likely to take advantage of the up to four year spend down, whereas the other half are either unsure or unlikely. So just to um, to emphasize that the, it's the flexibility, added flexibility would be appreciated. Um, and we might have we we may have some organizations who would want to try to spend down the entire uh, allocation in 2024 or the two years that the commission has already approved. Um, if additional years would be provided, then um, they would likely some would likely take advantage of that. Um, I did also want to recap and please I invite commissioners at this morning's eligibility and budget review committee to to chime in. I know that there were um, the committee did approve the recommendation for the four year spend down and the adjustment to continuing to to collect quarterly expenditures or expenditures on a quarterly basis, but rather than have them submitted to us every quarter. It would be twice a year and um, but there were concerns about oversight if, for those organizations in that four year period um, in tracking and what discretion uh, the commission may have if um, staff reported back in the reporting we would collect 
to say that, let's say a grantee um, had told us this is our budget for the entire amount, just a cumulative budget. And in their expenditure reporting, we realize that they're not actually spending it down and wanting to to understand if there were if there is any discretion in terms of, of that oversight and action to be taken. And so um, one, uh, please correct me if, if, that, if that didn't summarize that correctly, those concerns. Since this morning's EBR committee um, staff did convene to see if there would be a potential additional option, given that IOLTA is unrestricted, core funding, um, and once found eligible, we run the allocation, you're given an amount, you submit a budget that's approved, and then we just you know track against that. Um, and if there are modifications um, that need to be reported to us, we have our, our thresholds for approval, anything in excess of 25%, back to the committee and or commission for approval. And so one of the concerns was that as we staff presented um, the implementation of how we would actually manage or collect the budget, the cumulative budget, um, there was a concern that likely a lot of these awards would be much larger than prior years, given the 80%, 88% increase for, um, for 2024. And that the any deviation, um, it would it would have to be a very large amount for it to then potentially come back to the committee given the increase. And so if we just collected the total budget, not spread out across like a year by year basis. And so since then we staff it does propose and we confirm that we are able to do it timeline wise to instead collect a budget that does give grantees the flexibility or option to say to break it down across the four years, in which case then staff, if approved, um, the budgets you'll be getting in November to approve, staff would then be able to track against that. And then any um, changes year over year would then fall under our existing budget modification um, rules. And also knowing that the rules committee um, is currently discussing changes to that, including a potential rollover, a new rollover um, policy that would better track um, changes year over year within an existing spend approved spend down period. So I know that was a lot. Uh, let me know if there, um, EBR commissioners, please let me chime in if, if I didn't accurately represent the concerns or happy to answer questions as well. Yeah, I see Catherine's hand up. I have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to go <laughs> before Catherine and lead it off. Oh, perfect. Th thanks. I, I thought you did a fine job of ex explaining the discussion and the questions that were raised. Um, and if I understand what you've done in the interim, um, which would allay my concerns, is rather than one budget for the entire four year, they would be submitting a budget for each one of those years, and the, then the usual rules would apply against each one of those one, two, three, or four year budgets. Is that what, Rosia, what I'm understanding? Yes, that's accurate. So that, that makes me feel like there's a better mechanism to monitor, and then people could still project, I'm not going to spend all the money I anticipated in year one, I had difficulty hiring staff, and that could be that could then would that then be a carryover or a rollover, whichever whichever way that comes out then for the second year? Is that what would happen? Correct. It would be either a budget modification to our existing process or a rollover if the rules committee does okay. recommend that option to move okay. forward. Thank, thank you for the clarification. I think that's that's very helpful. Appre appreciate the work that you quickly did within less than an hour between the two meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Happy. Um, LA questions? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I um, wanted to clarify, we're talking about revising our de past decision on two years and going to four years immediately. Yeah, the, the commission um, did approve the two year and asked right. staff to explore if we would be able to, um, if you want to consider three or four years. And so based on the grantee survey and the feedback from the community, we're proposing the four-year option, but it would still be up to the commission if you wanted to keep it to the two, consider the three, a three-year or go for the four-year that you asked us to consider. Might that be applicable to the 2024 grant? 2024 only. This is, a, it would be a specific exception um, for flexibility because of the increase exactly. So then the commission would be able to consider whether to, um, since we are anticipating a, a large increase as well um, for 2020, five distribution, 
whether these same um, kind of added flexibilities would apply to that distribution or if it would just the the, the question here is just specifically for the 2024 we would award. decide that in 2025 or 2024 for 2024 yes exactly um jim did i yep. see your hand or did your question get answered yeah yeah i just wanted to i was going to add it's just for the 2024 so it's not going to be every year it's going to be doing this. I want to say, too, that we've had experience with these multi-year grants with the HP3. Most of the agencies were able to handle it okay, but we had a couple of spectacular failures. And the one difference here that I gave a cautionary approval, and I'm glad that you followed up with the, with the staff on this, but the one advantage we had with the HP3 is that we held on to the money. We gave them year one. And watch how they perform. Then we gave them year two that they budget. We watched how they perform. Then we gave them year three. And a couple of agencies we didn't give them year three because they messed up on year one and two. This is different in that we're giving them four years. Boom, all of it, which means we'll have to claw it back if there's major problems that they're not spending it. That said, my limited experience on this that the commission has always been successful in clawing money back. Agencies don't like doing it, but you always got it back because they know that they're going to come back to the commission in future years. So, but I just, it's a word of caution. Um, yeah, Efren. Yeah, just very quick. I, I just wanted to express appreciation. I didn't know the timeline you did it under. And, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and so I, I would just want to, I just want to give my, strong support and endorsement for this idea of the four year because if i'm wrong what i heard you say is and i'm still learning i'm new to the commission that iota funding is core operating and so sort of putting my previous philanthropy hat on the ability to take core operating dollars and spread them out across four years is so powerful for the sustainability of these organizations versus having a soak up what is really like the richest, best, beautiful kind of money, which is core operating all the way across. So I just want to express strong support. I think the four years they could probably spend it in two, but to take the core operating and spread it out to kind of cover all of that money they don't get back from government contracts, all of these project based money, I think it's just why it's very, very good on our part to think about that. Yeah. So. Okay, I have a couple questions. Are, is the thought that organizations would have the option to spend all of it from 2024 in a single year or two years or three years or four years? Yes. So does that, I mean, I don't want to presume a staff problem, but does that problem, does that fact create monitoring problems if you've got a range of our 110 IELTS of grantees choosing different things, different ranges of spend downs. That's something that we have discussed. It will be an added complexity, but we will be able to track it. We will be able to track it. And um, I forgot to mention that um, we do want to further explore if this is approved the four year spend down the reporting piece and what changes in addition to just the frequency of the expenditure reports, um, kind of what else we may want to propose to the commission at the November meeting um, to better capture um, or just kind of better understand the impact of this and the administration of it to ensure that we can see on top of it, report back, um, collect any information around, you know, what we're seeing for those that do opt to spend beyond the single year. Um, so that we do plan to come back to explore that further staff and, and come back to you in November. So uh, can I find one uh, or a couple? This is just a quick question, I think. But if I get this money and write a check for my next four years of rent, that's a current year spend with an out year impact, but it's a current year spend. Is that accurate? I believe so. And then, and then sort of. I, I guess I want to flag what I could see being a problem, but I don't want, again, I don't want to anticipate it, but it seems to me that if the, the challenge, uh, and again, I'm not, I don't want to suggest I don't support it yet, but I'm worried a little bit because 
one of the things about a one year cycle is that it's less flexible, but there's a very high level of visibility into how programs are doing with quarterly monitoring and reporting requirements like we as a commission have a really um, strong sense of how these organizations are doing in kind of in real time. And then when there are carryover requests, though there's a process that that gets elevated to the commission and we are alerted in, you know, close to real time, I'll call it not quite real time. The concern that I guess this raises for me is if you've got a four year program and you are doing a poor job of spending down on schedule. There is sort of a handy, I'm not like excuse is too strong a word, but there's a handy explanation that you're just gonna do it. And I don't really know how we would check against that because that's not really that's not really a carryover request if but you've got a budget every year. You have well, a separate budget for each year, right? Am I understanding? But the carryover, yes. but I think that is act, the carryover would not, and, and staff, please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm um, or misstating something, the carryover would not come into effect until the end of the, the option you're giving for spend down. So in this case, it would be after the four year. And then the commission could decide well, yeah. the, the, if you. That's, yeah. that's my point, Sorry. though. Yeah, that's my point, which is let's I'll make up the numbers. You get a million dollars, you say, I'm going to spend 250 a year for the next four years, year one closes, you've spent $0 and you say, don't worry, don't worry. We're going to get this out the door in the next three year two comes at no point has this e escalated to a carryover request until the very end. Wait, why isn't it a budget modification? Request? Budget yeah, modification it would be. Request. Yes. Uh, so I think this gets to the, the pivot we made <laughs> in between the two meetings and in collecting and proposing to collect a budget by year so that budget modifications come into play. The rules committee is considering what they're calling a um, rollover. So any funds not um, in this sense, if that were to move forward and um, rules committee, please correct me if I'm wrong. The idea being that if any funds from year one that approved for spending in the budget for year one are not used, that would need to come back um, and go through our approval thresholds to request to roll it over to year two. So there would be a mechanism to check yeah, so I get I, I I get that. That gives me more comfort. I think that was your dialogue with Catherine um, at the a moment ago. But I, and presuming we as a commission have the ability to address a budget change request, the tension that I guess I'm highlighting or seeing here is that we have generally been pretty lacks in terms of our understanding like with programs not lacks but understanding we've been quite understanding with issues that arise that cause budget change requests we, we we're generally th that's become the tension is that you know over a four-year period like how much how forgiving are you going to be I, it's hard to predict, but I feel like that's going to be a pretty big issue because of the dollars involved. So can I can I just like make sure I'm understanding your concern? Because the thing I'm on the budget modification rule, which is not this, but is related to this issue, because we are trying to come up with how to account for these issues. And the thing that and patients can speak to this, and with the thing that we've heard sort of at the rules committee is. It takes a while for, especially recruitment and, and in, in particular, it takes a while to like hire, get the money out the door. So there needs to be increased flexibility. And what you're saying is your concern is like, well, what if you can never hire and you're you're just sitting on this pot of money? Is that the concern? Like there's no way for us to scrape it back for four years? No, my concern is that we have generally been quite understanding with budget modifications because we tend to understand in the in real time they're expecting this problem to be resolved. Well, let's let's be clear though. We only do a budget modification review right now once a year. I know, but that's yeah. exactly my point. 
So that means that we are reflecting upon circumstances that are oftentimes just two, three, four, five, six months old. Sure. Now we're talking about budget modification requests, potentially, that would result, that would include explanations that are 40 months future looking. Like you'd say, well, yes, for the last six months, I haven't been able to spend this money, but I'm sure I'm going to be able to spend it in the next 36. That feels like a riskier proposition. So I, I guess, I guess from my perspective, I see that. So I, I'm, I'm really happy for the discussion that the committee had and for this. But I, it, it feels reasonable to me to say in the bu budget modification, to your point, Chris, like you, you can't just say I'm going to roll it forward and I promise I'm going to spend it. But what we want to see is what you're going to spend it on, right, so that we have more information to make an informed decision about how it's going to be spent. So part of the sort of balance there to me is in the questions that staff uh, requires programs to answer when they're requesting money to be spent in a subsequent year. And that's that's that was sort of another piece of the discussion of making sure that we got not just a promise, but a real but real information about what was the change, how is the change going to impact your second year, but you know, so so that it was more in real time. So uh, just just to further inform the discussion about what the committee was was thinking about so that we could avoid these just sort of rolling the money to the very end. Um, because I think particularly for me, we, we, if we have the authority to approve a, bu a budget modification and we decide not to pr uh, approve it because the program has no plan that seems credible, then I think that gives us some ability to better control what's happening with that money. And to add, I don't know if this gets to one of the concerns I thought I heard, if it's a timing thing in terms of grantees are currently and would continue to be expected to flag for staff when there is a um, budget deviation or need for a budget um, modification. And so staff currently, if it's a timing piece in terms of when that comes to staff, we review it and when we elevate it or how often that takes place within a year, I think process wise, that's something that we are able to adjust and elevate that at the next meeting as it comes up. Um, if, if EBR would want that to happen in the commission. So I think that's a process thing. Feel free to chime in, staff. If, if I miss anything, that, that we could adjust. I mean, I, I, just to go on there, and I know so I just that's a big back off of our seal, so I don't mean to cut the line. But um, we did talk about this because, in terms of like, uh, I think it was Chris or maybe Erica, the admin on, on the staff piece on our end is going to be heavier to provide this flexibility because we're going to need to monitor a little bit more closely to report back out to you. So we had had internal discussions. And I'm going to be very clear, we were split on that because it's going to cost more staff time. But on balance, I think the where we landed in terms of the staff reclamation, and, and you see it, right, which is the four years is like, we were willing to do it. You will, you, you will see the uptick in our admin costs because we are have to spend more time to monitor this, right? It's four years. It's going to be a lot of work to monitor it. We usually are very flexible with um, IOLTA, but because we're giving four years, I think we might not need to we might not be able to be as flexible because the money's going out so forward. Um, yeah. That's all now. So we'll, um, we'll go ahead and then go ahead. I just want to make sure I understand the incentives we have here. The next year's allocation is going to be based on how much money they're able to spend, or the year after, I guess. And so that budget, they're going to be incentivized to spend as much money as they can and not stretch it out because otherwise their next year's allocation will be lower. Am I understanding that correctly? It will depend on, yes, how they spread it out and what year then it would then impact future distribution. And that would be part of, if we move with the four year spend down, we'd make sure that we'd hold a webinar and clear guidelines and make sure that grantees understood the impact of yeah. how they would, when they would spend it. Otherwise they're shooting themselves in the foot if they spread it out evenly then all of their following year's allocations would be lower. Yeah. And I, unless unless there was a huge amount. Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a clarification of how that works. Yeah. Sorry, I don't
I think we can't hear in, in LA. I just say there's a clarification on, on how that works in terms of expenditures. Eric is going to clarify. Yeah, so the amount that an organization spends in their IOLTA and EIF funds in any given year is actually backed out yeah. before we run the funding formula. <laughs> so if they spend less in IELTA and EIF, it would actually have the result of increasing their award for the following year. However, if they save up all their money and then spend it all in one year, then yeah, they would get um, a lower award the next year. So it's it balances out eventually. Um, it's really just how they choose to spend it. It's, it's not that they're going to be deriving some sort of benefit um, or gaming the system, so to speak. It, it's just that how much um, gets backed out is going to impact their award for the next year, which will either be distributed across four years or it might all be done in one. Thank you. Well, it's a whole other thing. <laughs> so the, they just wanted to make one note, I'm still strongly supportive, but just wanted to jump on one note and say, yes, I think it is good to Catherine's point, to have a conversation, think about is the structure right, but around the concept of the four year, we just spent a lot of time talking about a reserve that was about fluctuations and how allocations may decrease. And it feels like having this money to allow organizations to spread out is just even another countermeasure to ease up on what potentially based on all of the projections in our budgets um, may be going down in the next few years. And so it just strikes me that, you know, I, I think there's a lot of incentive to figure this out and to Chris's point to mitigate the risk. But the idea that this is yet another, in addition to the reserve way for us to insulate what may likely be dips in the available funding is just worth it. That's a big incentive for us to figure that out. Um, okay, so I'm going to say Jeff and then let's take a vote and I'm mindful of the clock because we've got 20 minutes to do a bunch of reports. Um, Mr. So, Chairman, I'm going to be very quick. I just want to, as part of that discussion, I just want to point out to the commission members, we're looking at an 88% increase in funding for these organizations, and we expect them to spend that money in line with the guidelines that we've established. You know, our hope is that they will utilize that money according to the mission, but an 88% ramp up, it's important that they have this flexibility to appropriately meet the guidelines. So I, th I think that's also part of the idea behind giving them this additional time as well as the adjusted reporting structure. Thank you. Well said, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. I, I, just to be clear, as with many things on the commission, the work of the committee and the staff, I'm inclined to always to support. I, I just, this is a, quite a departure as is the amount of money. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this will require not just administrative work, but you know, eyes and ears on this on an ongoing basis. Um, I, I'll just note though yeah. that like, it's not as if this is, I, I, the staff obviously has done a lot of work, but also in the rules committee and that kind of stuff, we are thinking how to do this more broadly. And so yeah. what, in part, this is an opportunity for us to like try out our rules, make some adjustments, you know, and I don't think we're gonna be in a situation where we won't have sufficient oversight. Like if a, if a, um, if we're having them continue to do reports, if we're having them come in for a budget modification, if we're like providing some guidelines, like I don't think this is a situation where we cut them a million dollars and say, come back in four years and let us know how things are going, right? So I, and, <laughs> and to that, like, I think, you know, I appreciate that staff is taking on like a, a quite a significant burden in trying to a, accomplish this sort of shift. And for that, we're very grateful because I know I'm one of the people who is like, been trying to get this in, in a shift. So um, I do want us to like keep that in mind. So well, that's why the on balance and you're, you're going to hear more about it in November, like it's going to be coupled with some type of evaluation. It's not going to be so much services really, but we need to account for how that money's being spent if it's we're giving more latitude over so yeah. sure. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as presented on the screen. And Catherine uh, seconds the motion. Thank you, Mr. Paul and Ms. Blakemore. Right. Roll call. Abloggy? Yes. Paul? Yes. Hartmaster? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. <clears throat> okay. 
Miskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein, Cruz, Lee, Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Morales? Vargas? Asara? Connolly? Yes. Schreiber? Yeah. All right, uh, let's um, get through our reports. Juan well, and Elizabeth and Rocio. Um, I, I, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Elizabeth and Rocio. I'll be doing more of a revenue update uh, on my piece in, in, in November with Michael. Um, so I just really quickly um, about the Legal Aid Leaders Fellowship Grant Program. Um, as a reminder, we uh, the commission funded 75 summer law students at 36 of our grantee organizations this summer. We partnered with California Change Lawyers to provide additional support and programming to them. Um, and Change Lawyers also funded an additional five fellows. Um, so we had 80 fellows in the cohort. We just had a closing session with them earlier this week. They were so grateful for the support um, and the resources that we provided. Um, and so we'll be serving the students um, and the grantees will complete an evaluation and we'll report back at a future meeting. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that based on feedback from our grantees and the law schools on behalf of the students, um, that we needed to move up our grant cycle. Um, so we'll be convening the, law, uh, the fellowship committee shortly um, to begin some work um, on the RFP and rubric, um, as well as um, application review. Um, so at our November meeting, we'll come back um, to the commission to um, ask to approve the RFP and as well as to delegate authority to our XCOM to approve those uh, grant recommendations just because of the timing. So I um, just wanted to bring that to your attention and uh, apologize that we weren't able to bring that to you today. So, congratulations. Yay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, cool. that's great, that's yeah. awesome, yeah. And it's really so lovely to see all of them on the, in the little yeah. Zoom room. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they'll be back in person at some yeah. point soon. Um, great, thank you. I'll try to keep mine short. You heard a lot about grant updates or various uh, <laughs> funds. Um, just wanted to quickly update on monitoring visits. A reminder, we do monitoring visits every three years for our grantees and for brand new grantees in their first year. Um, we are about halfway through the 34 scheduled for 2023. And as a reminder, um, commissioners are invited to join staff if you're interested in learning a little bit more about a grantee, especially knowing that we have 10 new organizations um, being found eligible for ILTA EAF in 2024. So please reach out if you're interested. Um, quick update, you heard a little bit about, you know, our two federal grants um, or our federal grants and uh, federal or sorry, desk reviews. For those specific grants, that's HP3 and Cal HFA. And so we are in the process, or our fiscal team, in the process of completing desk reviews for those. And we have about 32 of 78 um, for HP3 formula and competitive grants complete. And we'll be do, uh, completing the remaining, uh, the remainder of those as well as for Cal HFA. And so we'll continue to keep uh, the committee and commission, the committees and commission um, up to date about anything we find. Um, did want to share that so far. Since these are the two, like for, um, first time we're doing, we're administering federal funds. Uh, there are two common findings that we're seeing around functional timekeeping and um, cost allocation. And so we do uh, plan on providing a workshop to grantees to invite them to learn how they could um, rectify some of those or correct for those findings. Just wanted to, um, to mention that. And then our bank grant, uh, bank grants fund committee uh, met couple of weeks ago, I believe, and just two quick updates. Um, the commission did delegate authority to the committee to approve an RFP for the remaining, I believe it's about four and a half million um, dollars to go out um, 2024 to 2025 grants. So that's a, a good update there. Um, we can share material. There's more information about what exactly um, the bank grants are. If you're not familiar with them, this is the last final um, pot left over from um, our prior bank grants. Um, and for uh, they can apply for either foreclosure prevention or community redevelopment legal services um, with a preference for projects serving rural communities. Um, so we can provide more updates on future meetings. And then also the leadership, um, the committee approved the creation of a working group. Um, so thank you, Tammy and Jeff, um, in advance for working with staff on um, leadership bank programs specifically with the focus of uh, revamping our communications around the program, everything for how we talk about it, you know, on our website, other materials, um, as well as um, making enhancements to our old portal and deepening relationships with banks. That's it for me. Thank you. 
<laughs> Can I make a suggestion because we're short on time um, to skip uh, 6.2 and 6.4 this time? There are um, reports on the PLL grants and the bank grants. Um, I think it's better to spend a little bit more time at the next commission meeting so that the commissioners have questions and discussion. That's okay. On 6.2 six, and 6.4? Six, six, yes, yeah, so we'll, we could do a quick report from um, the public council from Chris and then we'll turn to these on reports. Go ahead, Chris. Great. <clears throat> All right. This is this one is very quick, so I don't even have to speed up necessarily. The um, the, there's kind of the moment for um uh, at every commission meeting where a uh, budget modification that was above ten percent of the grant is brought to the commission as either an FYI or for a vote. This is an FYI. This is for a California Housing Finance Agency grant. As a reminder, those are three year awards. Um, they just finished their very first year of services. This request is coming to you through the executive committee and it is from public council. So this is a request that um, staff was able to approve. As you'll hear in a moment, it's at 10 to 25%. It's in that staff approval range. Um, this was the only request so far for Kelly Jaffe. Uh, it was a, about 23.1% of their three year grant. The revision amounts to $75,049. The, the, um, the, the reason was um, uh, they're just shifting staffing around. The, the kind of takeaway for the full commission for this budget modification is public council, like for its HP3 grant, and I think also its HP2 grant, has proactively flagged for this grant as well that 